John Rice Plumlee to the air, and he's taking a sideline shot for Baker. Oh, man! What a catch by Javon Baker. Oh. Javon Baker is an in- This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Wilson sprinting left, throws end zone, and it's caught. Touchdown. That was a great throw. The tight end, Isaac Rex. Our live coverage from Big 12 Pro Day at the Star is presented by FundedSportsTrader.com. Brooks breaks a tackle, looking for the sideline, and he's got it. Philip Brooks looking for his third career punt return touchdown, and he's got it. 365 Sports is presented by IdealMRI.com. High quality MRIs for $497 or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important, so is your budget. Look at that <laughs> Look at this from Bean. He says he can run too. Look at Jason Bean go. Picking him up, putting him down. Inside the 10, 73 yards. 365 Sports is also brought to you by Texas Farm Bureau Insurance, protecting Texans since 1952. Montgomery again has the friend and dives to the goal line. Touchdown Cincinnati. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. Brought to you by TFNB, your bank for life. Henderson in motion, looking to throw. Complete. Touchdown, Jared Wiley, the tight end. 365 Sports is turbocharged by Unite Private Networks. Find out more at UnitePrivateNetworks.com. 13th play of the drive, Jones to the air, touchdown, Xavier Henderson. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. It is one of the great days in sports with the opening of Major League Baseball. And then, of course, there's the Sweet 16, the first half of it tonight. And so much, of course, going on in the world of sports. We are live at the Ford Center, uh, the star in Frisco. This is the facility, the home of the Cowboys, just off the Dallas North Tollway. We are here because the Big 12 hosting their first ever uh, what is called Pro Days here inside this gorgeous facility. And we will hear from Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark, West Virginia AD Ren Baker, and some of the prospects that were here earlier today and some that are about to perform even this afternoon down below where we are on the concourse above one of the stadium end zones here in Frisco. It's been one hell of a day. We've enjoyed it. Appreciate the hospitality that we've had, too, from the Big 12. Yeah, absolutely. It's been awesome. Uh, it's it's been very fun. Like, oh, look, they're they're now throwing names up on the board. This is a um, the first time they've done this in a dress rehearsal, and it's pretty interesting to have here. And it's been a great thing. All the guys here have, have uh, raved about you know getting the opportunity and to to kind of get out here. So uh, it's been fun to watch. It's been fun to talk to the. Uh, to the, the guys that are here that are trying to get drafted and welcome to a new sponsor funded sports trader.com. And we'll tell you more about them in the coming days and weeks, but wanted to welcome them aboard today. Yeah, it's been a cool experience so far. I mean, it's uh, I think we're definitely the loudest people in here right now. Yeah. They're trying to run forties and I, can't tell who's up right now, but uh, it's been cool to see all the different players gathered under one roof and kind of all on the same team today, uh, competing against one another, competing against their positions in, in some ways as far as draft stock goes. But uh, we got the sense from some of the players that we've interviewed so far that they are gaining support from one another. Um, and that's pretty cool since it's a league-wide thing. And a lot of these guys might be strangers, but today they're they're all brethren trying to just live out their NFL dreams and put up the best numbers that they can. So uh, cool to be at the star. First time I've been here in probably a couple of years or so, I would think. It's been a little while, but this is a nice setting. And uh, it's been a pretty good day so far. Last time I was here was Big 12 Media Days when they did have it here. 
Uh, we did a high school playoff game here about six or seven years ago that ended up, I think, going three or four overtimes. In fact, Keontae Ingram, the running back at the time for Carthage High School, went to Texas. Eventually, USC was on the team, and Carthage played China Spring. We did that broadcast. So we will hear from the commissioner, Ren Baker. A couple of quick notes in sports. And, and again, they are running. I think the defensive backs are running. DBs are running the 40s down below us, which is about a 30-yard drop or so. John Jake is leaving Scott Drew's staff. Uh, the coaching tree of Scott Drew continues. It grows another limb. He takes over for Dusty May, who went to Michigan. May, of course, was Florida Atlantic. And yet another one of the heart and souls of the Scott Drew uh, coaching staff is on his way out. And yet another compliment to what that uh, program has done. Yeah, but this is, and look, and Scott Drew would tell you this, this is a loss. And he'll be able to replace him. And he's always hired fantastic assistants. That's that's the mark of a good head coach is that they bring in guys who compliment them well. But I think Scott Drew's always been kind of lucky to get guys that stay probably two to three years after they're ready to be a head coach. Yep. Jerome Tang was that way. Paul Mills was that way. McCaslin was that way. Um, Driscoll was that way. You know, so all the guys who are head coaches now, John Jacobs, honestly, if the whole staff had decided to take head coaching jobs after the national championship, they probably could have all gotten them. All right, yep. uh, but it's Alvin also, Brooks will probably yeah, be next. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Alvin Brooks. <laughs> I'm trying not to get too attached. <laughs> but uh, John Jacobs has certainly earned this opportunity. He's been bred at Gonzaga and Baylor. And if I'm FAU and I wanted to hire an assistant and bring them up like uh, like a John Jacobs type, like that's the that's the pedigree I'd want is you know a guy who's coached with two of the best uh, in the country country who is as level and even keeled as a human being as you'll ever meet uh, and can really reach players on a lot of different levels uh, and is just a brilliant brilliant dude I mean really you know if he was any walk of life he would have chosen you'd be like man that Jacobs guy in the, in the corner is, is pretty smart so we, we've had him on the show many times yeah. in fact just a couple of weeks ago and uh, and Craig it's they'll replace him you don't replace you have to replace the position and I'm sure Scott's got uh, that short list of what to do yeah, I'm sure he's got his Rolodex out today or has in mind who who is going to be uh, up next. But uh, John Jacobs, a guy had a couple go-rounds with the program, uh, was invaluable in many ways uh, and somebody who certainly deserves a boatload of credit for the success that the uh, Bears have had, especially here recently. Um, but a guy who's a, a great developer, um, a guy who's very well liked and uh, certainly very respectful and uh, just – everything you're looking for in a head coach. So it's not a surprise that Florida Atlantic decided to look his way. I just wasn't assuming he was much in the mix. I mean, I, I'm not a big college basketball guy as far as like paying attention to, to every little thing. So I wasn't really involving myself in the coaching carousel talk, but I knew Dusty may left for Michigan and just didn't really pay much attention to it after that. And then boom, out of nowhere, for me at least, it was John Jacobs. So I knew he was going to be a head coach at some point, just wasn't expecting it to necessarily be like right now. And so, yeah, that's uh, a great honor for him um, and certainly a great hire for FAU and a big loss for Scott Drew. But he's dealt with that. He dealt with Jerome Tang, and y'all have listed off all of the others now, Grant McCaslin. Um, Matt Driscoll, yeah. uh, Jerome Tang, Paul I mean, Mills. There's been a lot of guys yeah. come and go, and so he's been able to – you know, move on and find others and develop others as coaches, and I'm sure that's what he'll do here, but it's a compliment in the long run that so many guys who have coached underneath him or quote-unquote Scott Drew guys are now branching out and doing their own thing as uh, head coaches themselves, and uh, that coaching tree of his is getting a lot of branches on it. I mean, I, I don't know maybe a, a Patino or Calipari. I mean, again, I don't, I don't know all the details on everybody's history, but it'd be hard-pressed to think there's too many that have many more branches than what Scott Drew's developing here in a pretty short amount of time and, and what that could turn into ultimately. So, yeah, it's it's a, a great thing for, for him, but I also know it's a bummer for him because he's probably, you know, looking around the room like, man, where is everybody, yeah. you know, compared yeah. to just a couple of years ago? It's like that Will Smith meme when he's yeah. in an empty room and there's no furniture, there's nobody there. Also tonight, the Sweet 16, there's a couple of early tips in the 6 o'clock hour. Clemson at Arizona, that's a 6 and a 2. San Diego State, UConn in a rematch of the national championship game. That's a 5 and a 1. Alabama, North Carolina, a 4 and a 1 a little bit later on. And then, of course, Illinois 
and Iowa State, the number one offense in the country against the number one defense in the country, a three against a two. That will tip later tonight just after nine on TBS. CBS and TBS are the homes of those games. True TV will be involved in that second game along with the other one since they follow a game prior to them. Major League Baseball opening day. The Rangers officially start defense of their World Series championship today. Angels trail early in a game against Baltimore, one of the best teams coming back too. Mike Trout was the first home run this year for the 2024 season. It's a weird opening day to me because normally you'd have a chunk a chunk of games in the afternoon. There's just the one that's going on right now. Yeah, there were several media members that uh, could not get out of here fast enough today because they were getting over uh, to uh, for opening day festivities uh, in Arlington. So um, the Rangers, Wyatt Langford, uh, DHing batting fifth today. Uh, interesting little nugget in the lineup is uh, Zeke Duran. Uh, he is playing first base today. Yeah, they well Lowe's hurt. Yeah, and, and I don't know what couple of the other options might have been but uh, he because yeah, garver's about, gone and he yeah, probably would have done it last absolutely. year but. and ezekiel durant craig is one of the most flexible versatile players they have on this team but he's better when he plays short well there's a guy named seager that plays shortstop but he was really good for the rangers and then when he started switching positions dh whatever his average dropped his production dropped because he he sometimes didn't know from one day to the next what he was going to do but today, officially, they began defense of their World Series championship. So it's interesting, uh, and I'm very excited about that. I mean, it's a weight off my shoulders as a fan that you're not still waiting for them to finally win it. You know, now you can just – I almost feel like I can enjoy it more because they've got the title from last year, and now it's all about getting the second one or, or winning you know, two in a row. And, and that's all cool and well and good, but I just – there's just no longer like this emptiness that uh, resided in me as a Rangers fan for so many years of like, oh my gosh, they're never going to win a World Series. Like they're just never going to do it. And now that they've done it, it just it makes it a lot better as a fan. I'm very excited about this team and what they put together, which is awfully similar to last year, but with some additions to the pitching staff and uh, obviously Wyatt Langford, as you mentioned. So big day for the rookie to make his debut. He's got about as big a shoes as I can remember for a rookie in a at Rangers uniform in oh. a very long time, and just in baseball in general, I think he's got some of the biggest. Just given how hyped up he's been all off season and how quickly he's made it to the majors, so uh, yeah, that's going to be fun to see that, and just fun to see that get all started back up across the league uh, once again. But you said defend their title. I just right before we got on air, I saw a guy who clearly was peeved about seeing all of the defending their championship tweets because he said to like to whoever it concerns, you don't defend a championship. You know, I, I don't know. I feel like you do defend the championship, yeah. do you not? Until you're not the champion anymore, yeah. you do. I mean, listen, I, that's just somebody mad that they're the champions. Mm -hmm. You know, just another way to get under their skin. The from, Rangers are defending the World Series yeah, from champion. Houston. Yeah, probably from Houston. are. By the way, uh, we will. Brett Yormark is vi finishing up a video conference. Ren Baker can be flexible with that time at 3.30. Okay. West Virginia AD just heard from Ren, so we'll have him on following our conversation with the commissioner, um, Brett but, Yormark. By the way, uh, some interesting uh, Oklahoma State basketball news okay. in that they uh, have emerged, uh, Steve Lutz of Western Kentucky has emerged as the focus of their coaching search uh, to replace Mike Boynton. No deal finalized, but he's the primary candidate. Uh, third consecutive NCAA tournament appearance. Uh, Hilltoppers won the Conference USA title in his first season there, uh, but he came from from A&M Corpus Christi, uh, who, you know, had a, a couple uh, runs to the tournament the, the previous two years, had served four seasons under Matt Painter, seven seasons under Greg McDermott, and spent times on the staffs at SMU and some college uh, in East Texas. Yeah, you know, uh, wasn't it? Was, you, you didn't was, even, you didn't catch that, I, did you? I, Stephen F. Austin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I was trying to be uh, professional. I was thinking of, like, like ETBU. Jackson. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Eterno, or UT Tyler. Or maybe one of the junior colleges, too. So uh, so here where we are, we cannot show the field from our location. You can see us. We're just inside one of the entrances at the, the Ford Center, which is a 100-yard 100 100 yard football field. It's a gorgeous place. This is where the Cowboys, if they practice indoors, this is where they are. This is a, a place that has several thousand seats inside. It's, in a, it's a dome. Uh, right off of uh, the North Dallas Tollway in Frisco, a city that once had one high school, one, Frisco High. They now have 12. And it, I cannot explain the explosion of businesses that are here, 
buildings. It's like a uh, it's like a metropolitan look when you drive in to Frisco. When I got here late last night or late late yesterday evening to get ready to to, to relax a little bit and come here uh, for pro days. Anything from today? They they have not. They've posted names. They got videos up on the board. Again, we cannot show the field of the uh, the uh, uh, the what the players or prospects are doing because of of a copyright issue with the NFL Network, but we're here watching this. Um, every player, Craig brought this up a little, every single player we've spoken to has said that this has been an, an incredible uh, opportunity and experience for them since they've been here this week in Frisco at the Omni Hotel with all the facilities, the meals, the amenities, the experience, everyone. This is the first time anyone's done this. Brett Yormark and company uh, have done this, and they have all just raved about what this the, the last couple of days and also through the weekend will be like. Yeah, and uh, I talked to uh, someone who works for the city of Frisco, and, and they're really excited about the future of this event. Uh, of course, you know they, they love hosting things because it's, it's kind of what Frisco does now. Uh, but I think this one, I mean, and it's a nice event. Like, and it, it, look, if you have ever gone to a combine or seen it, you know, it's there's not a you know a lot of frills here. It's not something that's uh, glorious. But if you're a football fan, you like watching these things, then you know, shoot, come on. I mean, it's it's a free event to the fans, and you can come out here. And I think next year this thing is is going to be probably a little bit more of a party than it was this year. But I think they had to get the you know, the football stuff, the actual functional part of the event right uh, before they start kind of, you know, adding some hype to it, which I I can see, especially knowing Commissioner Yormark, you know, and what he's done, uh, there's probably going to be a little more uh, flavor to this event even next year. It's a business trip for these players. Yeah, it's a business trip. Yeah, uh, for able to go back to uh, Oklahoma State, if in fact they found their guy, then good for them. That uh, answers a big question that's been lingering now for uh, a little while, and certainly with West Virginia making their hire, Oklahoma State even more on the clock as, as other schools also were making higher. So good to see that they've uh, potentially landed on their guy to, to take over and hopefully bring that pro program back to um, some prominence. But, yeah, this has been cool. I mean, it's not, like Paul said, a uh, really, I guess, uh, – highly entertaining type of a thing there's not like you know you don't hear a lot of music blaring there was a little bit of it but it was still just kind of low and just kind of like background music and it's just been just straight business really uh but i could definitely see to his point of where you know your mark looks at it and others look at this and find out ways to, to spice it up i think you know certainly uh, if you have a year where there's multiple quarterbacks, that could always bring a lot more to this party. Uh, and this year you only have just the three uh, in, in John Rice Plumley and Emory Jones and Jason Bean. So um, there's not like the, the big pull as far as QBs go. Um, there's some good players here, but I don't think that there's like just – that star power, you know what I mean? That it, that would create a little bit more of a buzz um, if they were, you know, borderline top 10 picks or first round type of guys. There's a lot of really good players. There's not necessarily in the eyes of scouts, it seemed like great players today. Now, maybe that changes, you know, on Saturday when they have the second part of the workouts and, and other new faces show up. But it's been, you know, really well organized. It's been, you know, pretty seamless. And it uh, seems like uh, the scouts have got uh you know a nice setup to be able to to get all their information and, and try and find the next big thing uh from the crop of prospects here so it's been cool to see uh it's been great to hear from the players who seemingly have enjoyed it see a lot of them interacting with one another uh who otherwise would not, not even maybe ever meet each other uh, maybe they did it media days for some of these guys but it's cool you think they're all on the same team actually yep. uh, which is kind of neat i thought what jared wiley said uh, he's here he was at the pro uh, at the combine and how he said he was here to support a bunch of his guys who are teammates, even though they weren't. Yeah, and so there's some of that. There's just you know just guys getting to meet each other and whatnot. Sonny Dykes was rolling through here earlier. You know, I think in future years, if this becomes like a permanent thing, which it sounds like it's going to be, then you know more head coaches might make their way up here, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know things like that can always get uh, a little bit more high profile. But yeah, for the first day of this first event and and bringing all of these different people and players and teams together from all over the country it's uh been pretty cool all right this is what we'll do here because of brett yormark running late we'll take a break early come back and hopefully by then brett yormark and ren baker in this first hour john rice Plumley uh will be a part of the show isaac rex the tight end at byu philip brooks who's a wide receiver kick return punt return specialist at kansas state they spit those out 
in Manhattan, Kansas. They'll be a part of the show, among more. We did talk to Emory Jones and also to Jason Bean, as Craig mentioned. All the three of the quarterbacks we have interviewed, if you don't hear them today, you will hear them on our show tomorrow on 365 Sports. Back in a moment in Frisco. And again, a huge three or four day event for players trying to get looked at one more time by NFL teams uh, among the 32 that have, of course, the, the league itself. The combine was in Indianapolis. There are players who were a part of that that are here, but most of these are guys that have been under the radar. And this is 365 Sports. Cars price right, day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks will feel. Let the journey to financial brilliance begin with Jinko's limited time offers. Max your earnings with a Kasasa Cash account and get paid monthly with a 4.25 APY. That's $425 annually. Then invest in a 13-month share certificate and earn 4.9 APY. That's $529. Earn cash and outshine the rest. At Jinko, we offer you the sun and the moon. Kasasa based on average daily balance of $10,000. Certificate based on $10,000 investment. See JinkoFCU.org for details. NCUA. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lakeshore Drive is a premier elite life-changing experience where you can change your mind, body, and soul. Offering over 50 group exercise classes every week, including boot camp, bar, silver sneakers, and 10 cycling classes with morning and evening classes available. New state-of-the-art bikes that allow you to compete against yourself with a screen monitoring your speed, miles, resistance, and power. Personal training with Christy London, Randall Corley, Alex Botch, and Nathan where you will be encouraged and motivated to grow, losing inches in weight the right way. There's a kids club included with your membership, plus sauna and tanning bed. 16 tennis courts, plus a beautiful stadium court and longtime youth tennis pro Britt Coleman and assistant junior pro Kenna. Adult tennis lessons and clinics with Blake and the commitment to pickleball with eight courts and instructor Jody Thurman. Visit the website at wacotennis.com next to Hawaiian Falls on Lakeshore Drive in Waco. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. Baylor Scott and White Southwest Sports Medicine Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, a wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott and White Southwest Sports Medicine Orthopedics wants to get you back in the game. This is 365 Sports. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. So this as far as uh, NFL, pro days, and much more. Michael Penix Jr., Washington quarterback who had what a spectacular year, ran a 4-4-6 today at a pro day. 4-4-6 for Michael Penix junior at a pro day today for the university of washington well you and what was the thing oh he might be slow right he might not be that quick he might be uh heavy footed uh four four six again um look if somebody came to me right now like a some sort of genie or you know blue devil type thing and said i will grant you the power to run a four four six but you have to punch garrett in the face like garrett's getting punched in the face <laughs> Garrett's probably punching back too. So I mean, look, I, look. I, I, after I punch him in the face, I can run a four-four-six. So good yeah. luck. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, yeah, true. Oh yeah, you can't catch him. You're exactly <laughs> yeah. right. So yeah, that's a miss. That's impressive. Uh, I hadn't really given much thought to 
to his 40 time or what he might run. But uh, when I heard that, I was like, oh, wow. I, I definitely don't think I would have said, you know, 4 4 6. Um, would have res- given him a respectable prediction, but uh, that was a little faster than, than I would have thought of. So, yeah, I mean, no surprise he's a great athlete and uh, no surprise he's a he's a real dual threat. I think that the big thing with, you know, him is just his injuries and, um, you know, he's a little bit older, but that's just going to be par for the course most of the time now in college football. You're going to have older older players uh, from time to time. Um, but, yeah, he, he went and had a magical season, and he's not getting that uh, top of the first round type of love because there's just other guys who are deemed yep. better. But uh, I think he'll make a very interesting quarterback prospect for somebody. And I think he's one of those that will have that chip. Uh, the injuries, of course, are a part of his history. If somebody would have asked me if he was fast or quick, I would have said quick. Yeah. Because when he ran the zone read, he was very elusive. But I never thought of him straight line speed. And obviously today, putting that number on the books would be great for him. And others that might just pique their interest a little bit more. We know he can throw the football. Mm-hmm. We know he's got accuracy. We know he can throw the deep fade. We know he can throw pretty much anything. Uh, uh, I mean, he was, he was spectacular this year. But that's interesting. Uh, that uh, that he was a part of uh, the pro day. Not he, he needed to get something on the books, and he did. A four four six is a great number for Michael Penix uh, Jr. Uh, one of the things that uh, is interesting about this event, and we've been asked, and, I, and I'm trying to get the information from the Big Twelve. How many pro teams were represented today? I don't know if it's 32. I don't know if there's 60 scouts. I don't know if there's 100 scouts. We're working on getting that because remember. There's waves here of what is this morning with quarterback, wide receivers, running backs, and tight ends, and then this afternoon the t- uh, the, the defensive backs are running among others, and then there'll be another, then off day tomorrow, and then they'll turn around Saturday and they'll crank up the big dudes. Yeah. So I've seen. I mean, obviously, I've seen. I saw Will McClay out here earlier. Um, he just had to the, walk down the hall. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It would be. It would be reckless of him not for, to be here. Yeah. Like for those that don't know, I mean, we're in the Star, uh, which is the. Cowboys, Cowboys headquarters. Yeah. I mean, this is this the whole area is theirs basically. Mm-hmm. This is their whole plaza, and then they get all these restaurants and hotels that have been built up over the years. Really nice restaurants and yeah. hotels, and so the you know we ran into a guy who used to work with us at the radio station, Kyle Yeomans, who works here, and he was telling us like, well, he's just down a couple turns, and he's at the Cowboys offices. So that's. That's why the Cowboys definitely have a, a reason to be here yeah. for sure. But I've seen scouts from the Texans, uh, Lions, um, uh, Steelers, and I want to say the Browns. I saw them for sure. And then I think I saw someone from the Chiefs, but I'm oh, I not totally sure. He was wearing red. It was red shirt. So I'm, I think it was the Chiefs because I saw more yellow than gold. So could have been the Chiefs, could have been the 49ers, but I think it was the Chiefs. Could have been a Hulkamaniac. Yeah. Red and yellow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, could have been a Hulkamaniac. Yeah. yeah. With the red Hulk and yellow. Man. But no, no, I mean, there seems to be a really good contingent here. I mean, most of the people here are scouts. Uh, I don't know if people realize, but it is free to the public, right? So you can mm-hmm. come here uh, yeah. Saturday, and there's a few people. There's, you know, two, three dozen people, uh, maybe more, because I got a big column blocking me that are over in the stands just sitting and watching. But, yeah, I'd say that the bulk of the people here are, are scouts. Uh, a lot of notepads out writing down stuff uh, as yeah. the 40 times are being ran right now. I would now. be surprised if there's not at least 25 or all yeah. 32 because it's Dallas and Fort Worth, even though Frisco's north of Dallas. Uh, you, you, you have scouts all over the country. Uh, you have regional scouts and different uh, scouts that are here, I would think. And there's a bunch of people who are sitting in the stands who are probably either family, agents, relatives, or people a part of the entourage and scouts. Uh, and there's a stack of about 30 right there at the finish line on the 40-yard, uh, uh, 40 meters that they're running right now. So, again, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll get uh, Brett Yormark here in a minute. We're trying to juggle that a little bit. Uh, let's, let's do this. Um, uh, Definitely 40 yard dash, not the 40, 40, 40 meters. I say 40 <laughs> yeah. meters, the 40 yard dash. Um, I, I I don't want us to be. We're, we're pushing Ren Baker back. We could have. It's kind of a when when you have a, a, the lead guest and, and it is Brett Yormark. Let's do another one, Garrett. Let's uh, relax here, take another break. That will be able to just go full throttle from Yormark to Baker to Re- John Rice Plumley among others. And this is 365 Sports.
Pizza, burgers, and Bears football. There's no place around Waco that serves them all other than Bubba's 33. Come show your green and gold and enjoy some of Waco's best food and beverages while watching your favorite team, the Bears. When real Bears fans get hungry, Bubba's 33 is the number one spot for ice-cold drinks, hand-stretched, stone-baked pizzas, and bacon-infused burgers. Join us for indoor or patio dining. Bubba's 33, Waco's restaurant and proud supporter of Baylor Bears football. Sick'em, Bears. Riverbend Liquor and Wine now has two locations to serve you. The original on Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street and the brand new spot in downtown Waco at 600 Franklin Avenue. If you're looking for the best in craft beers or local Texas bourbons, then the original is the place to be. And for the latest trends and online phenomenons, head downtown to the Franklin location. Either way, you're going to get the same great variety, customer service, and speedy experience. Check out both locations on their Facebook and Instagram pages. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street, and now downtown on Franklin Avenue. Samantha Duvall, TexasBeefHouse.com with me, David Smoke. And tell you what, you guys keep rolling along. You do have yet another date, correct, for an online and live auction. Yes, our next online and live auction will be Thursday, April 25th. We've discussed how this has been unique and how people have reacted to it. Has that momentum continued as you've done more? Yes, it's kind of half and half. We'll have a good amount of people there that are from the area. And then we have probably 40% that we we ship out and everybody that I've delivered locally to has talked about how much fun they had and they want to know when the next one's going to be. We've gotten great feedback from the people that we've shipped to. They're all just so excited about this event and they can't wait for the next one to happen. Premium grade East Texas beef. Customers don't have to go out and buy their beef. TexasBeefHouse.com from their family and their ranch to your plate. TexasBeefHouse.com. Texas Farm Bureau Insurance has been proudly serving Texans across the state for over 60 years. Call 254-772-8090 to find an agent who will provide a free review of your auto, home, and life coverage. This is 365 Sports. The Sikkim 365 app is brought to you by Alan Samuels Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram Fiat. Come by, let's be friends. All right, Brett Yormark is wrapping up a video conference call. We are joined by West Virginia Director of Athletics, Ren Baker. Brett will join us here momentarily at the uh, Big 12 Pro Days in Frisco. And, Ren, thanks for your time with Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, David Smoke on 365 Sports. You have been quite the busy man. How thrilled are you with DeVries as your men's basketball coach who you introduced yesterday? Well, we're we're very excited to uh to have coach degrees and and you know when you set out on these searches you're always looking for a variety of uh, boxes to check and and very pretty early on we we figured out that we thought um that he, he fit our profile best and um as we had conversations with him um you know it just continued to confirm that so uh we were very excited to have him and and his family uh here and, and they're a great fit for morgantown and, and west virginia and certainly he plays very exciting brand of ball and um, it got confirmed today that, that he's bringing a pretty good recruit with him uh, that's going to uh, be a transfer as well. So so that that's a good thing, too. Yeah, not not many coaches uh, can bring a player that they made uh, themselves. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big deal. Uh, so, Ren, the, your first year plus on the job has been uh, a, a little bit tumultuous in that what you walked into is that, you know, a football situation that you had your fans asking a lot of questions. That was answered emphatically uh, uh, by Coach Brown and, and his team. Uh, and then you had to fill the basketball job, which is something you didn't expect to do when you walked in. Is it a relief to be able to be at this point where football and men's basketball are on level ground now and you can just move forward with making them better? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, anytime you you feel like you've solidified leadership with, with people that have the character and, um, you know, and, and the integrity that, that – that Neil Brown does and now coach DeVries and uh, you, you feel really good about that. And there, there's been some unexpected curveballs uh, since I've been here. And um, I'm not generally somebody who spends a whole lot of time um, thinking, you know, thinking back about the, about the past, but uh, definitely I'm excited to have leadership solidified in those two programs because it just allows you to think more about um, the future and how we're going to address what is um, a rapidly changing environment in college athletics. And, and I think, 
is going to continue to to change a lot over the next 24 to 36 months. Ren, what were the boxes that you were looking to check uh, with this hire? What specifically were were things that you wanted in in the next basketball coach? And, um, you know, how quickly were those kind of checked off when you got to start talking with Coach DeVries? How quickly did all that start to come together and you realize, like, hey, I think think we got a guy here that's going to be the right fit? Well, I think, first of all, in the Big 12, you you have to have a well-rounded team. You can't have a team – that's just good at defense or a team that's just um, focused on, on offense and getting a volume of shots. You really have to have somebody who has a fairly high efficiency on both ends of the floor, um, also takes care of the ball, that, that rebounds the ball uh, well, that, that can match the physicality of the teams in this league. And, um, and so, you know, that was one of the first things we looked at is all the various analytics and metrics and uh, deep dive into Ken Palm and, and uh, other programs and, um, really felt like uh, from a style of play, uh, from from a from a uh, well-rounded um, team concept that he, that he certainly checked that box. And then, uh, you know, we're in the Northeast, uh, kind of the gateway of the Northeast, I like to say. But um, West Virginia culturally is more Southern or Midwest, and so you have to have somebody who really wants to to understand the culture, who who's okay living in a college town who understands that in this state there may only be 1.8 million people, but there's 1.5, 1.6 million that hang on every possession, and you don't just represent a basketball program or even an institution, but really you're you're a visible ambassador across the entire state. And um, so you have to have somebody, you know, not everybody is is fit to be in that fishbowl 24-7, 365. And, And even when I came here from North Texas, um, when I got off of campus, I got to live in, in um, fair, fairly an, an, an anonymous life. Um, here, it's, it's not that way. So we spent time uh, looking through that um, and, and, and making sure that we had somebody that could fit that. And then, um, you know, we wanted somebody uh, that, that had integrity um, and that understood in today's environment how to build a championship culture and to teach young people not just the sport of basketball but about being leaders um, in an environment where, let's be honest, the portal and NIL are part of that recruiting conversation. So how do you do both of those things? And, um, and he was able to articulate that very, very well. Um, and I think the last thing is, is um, you know, we, we definitely wanted to recruit somebody um, to be here, but we also wanted somebody who felt the calling to be here. And he had done a lot of research and homework on this job. You know, Coach DeVries, it's, it's the most interesting resume I've ever seen. Um, he's only been at two places. Um, in in 20, uh, 23 years or whatever it's, it was, he was, an, he was an assistant for at Creighton for seventeen years, head coach at Drake for six, and so he has not been a job hopper. He's been very careful where he selected to go, and you know I think he felt drawn to this job. And um, I think anytime you're looking for a leader, you want somebody who doesn't just want a job but wants your job, and uh, and we found that in him. So uh, I did see where Mike asked he covers West Virginia. Uh, had made a comment about you had a personal relationship with Dusty May, who's now at Michigan. You guys have known each other very, very well. Did he text you after DeVries was named the head coach at West Virginia? He did. He texted me and said, congratulations, you got a ball coach. Um, and he, I think ball is in all caps. And so he was, he was really happy uh, for us. And I got a lot of respect for him. Of course, I congratulated him uh, as well. And, and uh, you know, he did. Uh, if you weren't inside conference USA, you may not have a full appreciation for the job that, that Coach May did at um, FAU, but that was a really, really tough job when the AD, Brian White, got there and then hired Dusty, and together those two made that um, one of the great success stories in, in uh, college athletics the last couple of years. Well, there's only one problem, is that that connection with FAU, Dusty May, you could have told Dusty to stay because now Scott Drew lost yet another assistant coach in John Jacobs who's taken his place. At least it's not in the league, though. No. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Mean, I, I, I thought, uh, you know, I never thought uh, Coach Drew would, would uh, leave Baylor because I know how much he loves it there, but I also know how much he hates coaching against his former coaches. So, you know, if one more would have went inside the league, that may have been all that, all he could handle. So, um, no, I uh, I saw that, and, and uh, man, I, I don't know Coach Jagas real well, but, but had so many people, including Coach McCaslin and, and Mac and, and Coach Drew speak so highly of him. Kevin Gall spoke very highly of him. And um, so I texted Brian White and told him I thought that was a great hire. And 
um, listen, uh, you, you hate to, I hate for you guys that you lost a, a great uh, man and a great assistant coach, but um, I'm glad that we don't have another Scott Drew disciple in the league to have to play. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine, though, if his uh, brother Bryce at Grand Canyon like ended up at Oklahoma State, which looks like they have their guy, but can you imagine Scott would absolutely just melt if that happened? Oh, he, he'd probably be wanting to uh, for you guys to exit the league and go somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I know, like Gr- Grant used to always tell me how bad Coach Drew because I, you know, when I was at North Texas, I'm like, why don't we play Baylor? He's like, Coach Drew hates playing his former assistants, and so now to be forced to do that inside the league, I'm yep. sure that 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 that's torture for for him. And uh, but uh, what a great credit to to Coach Drew and the program there that um, you know. It, I always go back to people talk about how um, Jimmy Sexton has almost all of the clients um, inside uh, football head coach clients inside the SEC. But the reality is, is he had Nick Saban and then everybody has, has hired a lot of Saban assistants and tried to replicate what Alabama had going there and that Jimmy had a lot of those. And, you know, I think it's a huge compliment to, to Coach Saban that that's the case. It's a huge compliment to Coach Drew that, People inside our league see the way that, that Baylor plays year in and year out, the consistency they play with, the way they represent the institution and the conference and how competitive they are nationally, and they want to emulate that. And, uh, you know, imitation is the, is the sincerest form of flattery. So um, even though it may not be fun on game night, what a, what a credit to Coach Drew that, that that's what people have tried to do. The style that Coach DeVries uh, brings in, it, I mean, Drake was fun to watch. Uh, how much of that goes into, uh, I mean, obviously style and what you can recruit to, but when you're watching a coach and watching them play, if you're enjoying it watching as a fan, does that like go into like, man, I, I think I, I would like doing this every night uh, if, we, if we could in Morgantown? Uh, there's no question. I mean, you want, um, you know, you want a style of play that, that people enjoy. Um, watching um, now, the, the biggest thing is is that you win games, right? I mean, people love to watch a winner. Um, you know, when I was at, at UNT with Coach McCaslin, um, he had some unbelievably terrific defensive uh, teams um, during our time there at North Texas. But we played a more deliberate pace, and people every time we were on TV, that's all anybody wanted to talk about. And, and as a person who, um, you know, I coached basketball early in my career, love love hoops. I never felt like we were like a slow, methodical um, style of play. I just thought it was very well coached, very disciplined um, basketball. And then, you know, Grant's played a little different this year at Texas Tech where they were a little more um, offensive uh, heavy. But, um, you know, I, I think for me, um, I just want somebody um, who values who values possessions, who, try, who works really hard to get good shots, and who works really hard to play good defense and ultimately limit offensive rebounds and, and second chance opportunities. And, um, and, and if you do that, I think the basketball purist in me just feels like um, that's good basketball. Let's watch it. So I'm not somebody who feels like you have to run and gun or get up to a certain number of threes or throw alley oops. I just, uh, I know those things are entertaining and fans love those, but uh, over the course of my career, what I have figured out is more than anything else, fans just like to win. And so um, I put more, probably more value in that, but 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 in this case, um, Coach DeVries does have a style of play that is interesting and fun to watch. They do try to score in transition. They do try to score early in the shot clock when the defense is still trying to, um, you know, get settled. And and so I think fans will enjoy watching. Them. You brought up. Uh... You know, a few minutes ago, just uh, all the changes in college athletics, and I know it probably gets tiresome to talk about, you know, NIL constantly or transfer portal and all the kind of things that have been looming for the last couple of years, but there's new things uh, on the horizon, obviously. I mean, there's all of the talk about revenue sharing and uh, just what things are going to look like moving forward. Conference realignment still very much a thing in play, but for you, um, among all the things that are out there right now, what is maybe – the I don't know if the biggest threat would be the right word, but what's kind of the thing that's most top of mind for you when you think about the college athletics landscape right now and and the biggest issue or, or, or perhaps threat in some cases? Yeah, I, I think for me, um, it really is just the unknown. Um, we went through a period of time here where um, I don't think uh, most of us athletic administrators and coaches for that matter, mind to, mind to be asked to chart a course from point A to point B. Um, but when you don't know where point B is, that's just so frustrating. And we're going on months and years now of not being able to figure out where point B is. So um, I wish we could all just get locked in a room and we don't we don't get to leave players, coaches, ADs, presidents, 
commissioners, everybody, and we don't get to leave until we have a plan um, because I think the way that we're doing this now where, um, you know, day to day the, 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 the uh, point B changes because there's a court case here or, or um, you know, a, a decision made uh, there that, that, that really changes the course of where we're headed. And so, you know, I think that's probably what stays top of mind for me is just how frustrating it is to not have an ideal of, of where we're going to end up because I think once we know where we're going to end up, then you can get into that planning, uh, that planning phase. But, you know, I would say it's not unlike, um, you were to start to try to build a house with no house plan. Can you imagine how frustrating that would be, um, to try to figure that out. And so that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, and so, uh, my hope is that over the course of the next, um, you know, year, that we understand that ultimately this is big picture what it's going to look like. So let's figure out how, how we're going to chart a course to get there. Ren, were you disappointed uh, when, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, the college football playoff came out with the revenue split with the Big Ten and SEC getting a larger chunk? That was not a surprise, but such a drop-off. Was that something that was a, a punch to the gut for Big 12, even though you're still in the game, so to speak, which you have earned? Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think you have to look at the positive. There's still uh, four power conferences. There's going to be four uh, conferences that get an AQ a um, uh, every every year. We don't know exactly how, how the rest of the field is going to be determined, if there's additional AQs or if they're, they're all at larges. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there are positives um, and that there's a look in and we can, uh, based on performance, have a chance to make adjustments in that formula. But but I but I, I think where I was disappointed is um, I'm fine if if one conference is, is putting in more teams and and advancing more teams and able to um, you know therefore to, to demonstrate that they're they're contributing more value to the system and so they they're going to get more out of it that's fine I think that should be decided on the field in real time every year. Um, and, and there are lots of models and systems that will allow for that um, to predetermine uh, that because historically um, whether this conference has done this or that conference has done that, to predetermine how you're going to split that, to me, feels un-American. It feels unfair. Uh, it feels like it de-incentivizes um, in some cases. And so um, I think that's disappointing, um, you know, and, and uh, it's not something that, um, I think any uh, any of us felt great about, um, but but ultimately I think um, you know the the, the commissioners and, and Commissioner Yormark did um, his gave his best effort, put us in the best position possible, um, and at least we know where we're at and we know what we have to do to to increase what what uh, our percentage would be. Ren, it seems to me that um, when you see things like the 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 things they throw out of like we want to be. You know, and obviously the the guaranteed spots didn't happen, which was a good thing for everybody. And uh, with the money, it, it seems like they're guarding against an eventuality that's going to rarely happen. So, like one year, they 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 may not get every, all the things that they're used to. That would just seem to be silly to be guarding against something that is so on the outlier of sports, because sports is random, as you know. Yeah, there, there's no question, and you know, like ultimately. Um, everybody, and I think it's how we get to where we have in college athletics. Everybody is just looking out for their best interest today, right? And so I think um, probably, you know, you had the SEC, who I think is fairly confident in what their position is going to be moving forward, but you got the Big Ten, who doesn't want to be second field to the SEC. And then, of course, you have the other two conferences who want the best positioning they have. And so there's a lot of dynamics and a lot of things in play. Um, in those discussions, and you know, I were I, I wasn't in the room, so I don't know uh, everything that that occurred. Um, but but I do, uh, you know, I do think that there there was a way to uh, to, to to do a, a system and a method that maybe the outcomes wouldn't have been that much different, but they weren't predetermined. And uh, you know, I, I think people could have accepted that more than than uh, maybe the predetermined um, rev share split. And we still don't know the exact formula, right? We we we, we say that, that the multiple AQs for that maybe more for one league are done, but we really don't know that for sure because that that ultimate format is not determined. Um, we just know it kind of got shelled for now. Um, but um, you know, the the what's important for the Big Twelve, and it would be for the ACC as well, but. 
we need to be laser focused on making our fo- football product the best it can be, on making the right hires, making the right investment, doing the right thing. Because ultimately, if we want to have more say um, after this this round of CFP, then we need to perform very well uh, in this in, in this uh, CFP. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's what's what's most important. Um, and that's that's where our energy can be focused and, and we can actually change outcomes and change our tra- trajectory. But were there some options that were put on the table with the format that were just not going to be allowed? For example, if the SEC and Big Ten had a first round bye with whoever was their, their number one seed, were there some things that were thrown out that were just part of negotiating rather than knowing that it might pass just to see what might be said? Yeah, I don't know exactly what was and wasn't thrown out because that was done mainly with the commissioners. Now, you know, Commissioner Yormark uh, does a pretty good job of, of communicating uh, with us transparently and, and, and efficiently. Um, so I think there were probably a lot of things discussed, how ultimately um, w- it landed on, on where, where it did. Um, you know, I, I think that was, would probably be uh, better questions uh, for him to answer. I just wasn't in right. the room. but. But but I but I do uh, I I think you know the public outcry of against that probably had an impact would be my guess on um, that all getting pulled back um, and so you know I think it's important for fans to know I mean you know at, at the end of the day the CFP is valuable because there's interest and people want to watch it if we create a system that um, isn't fair or or somehow de incentivizes people from certain schools and certain uh, conferences from from watching and participating, then the, that 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 decreases the value of the CFP, which is bad for everybody. So, I, I do think um, in some of those cases that uh, that the public kind of um, you know set setting in stone what they want to see and don't want to see probably does help frame some of those conversations. Ren, uh, we've known you, and obviously the connection with Mac at Mizzou, and then UNT with North Texas, and when you took the job at West Virginia, we've discussed the decisions you've had to make with uh, Neil Brown coming back and then 9-4 and four and then the extension and, the, of course, the basketball issue, Coach Huggins, and then a new coaching search after the uh, uh, last year. Uh, it probably, in my opinion, even though you don't like to see drama, et cetera, with how you've handled it has endeared you to that West Virginia fan base perhaps more than ever. Do you agree? I think it has. Um, you know, when you go through tough times together, um, you get a chance to see what, what you're made of. And so the people here have put their arms around me and, and, um, and my family and have loved us and treated us extremely well. Um, and I think they have appreciated, um, even if they didn't always agree with every decision we made, I think people appreciate that, that I try to communicate the logic and reasoning behind the decisions that, that we've made and um, have tried to do it with, um, class and, and, and with grace as we're dealing with really tough situations. And so I do think it gives, it's given me a chance to probably prove more about who I am as a person um, and, and the way that I try to, to provide um, leadership and work together to build a stronger department. And it's certainly given me a chance to see um, the heart, the passion, um, you know, the, the hospitality, um, that, that West Virginians have. And um, so I do think it's probably helped us get endeared more to our general fan base and certainly with the leadership when you talk about the board and, and, and those, those folks. I mean, we've had to have a lot of tough conversations in a short period of time, uh, but, but I think it's probably drawn us closer together. Last thing, what and how does it affect your budget moving forward when you hear Macro just said this, also others have brought it up, uh, I saw where uh, Troy Dannon yesterday mentioned that there will be a line item for student athletes when it comes to whatever you're going to call it, whatever they become as far as uh, them getting paid that's through the budget of your athletic department. Yeah, I mean, it's something we talk about all the time. And, you know, even when uh, we recently uh, did uh, Coach Brown's contract and then just hired a new basketball coach, I mean, we, we talk about there's going to have to be some decisions made um, we probably cannot continue to spend money on um, uh, at, the, at the level that we have and at the escalation that we have on a lot of different things, and that would include um, salaries, but it would include nutrition and um, and uh, you know strength coaches and 
you know, all, all of those um, other uh, things that, that we spend money on. And if you look at what college athletes provides relative to the pros, we spend more on training tables and meals and we spend more on mental health professionals and we spend more on strength coaches. And, um, and so there is, a, you know, when people say student athletes don't get any benefit, they're getting a ton of benefits. Um, it's just that moving forward, those benefits may be different. It may be uh, more in form of a, of a cash payment. And I understand that, that, uh, you know, that there's, there's going to, um, that, that some, to some level that's going to happen. Um, so I think where we're at as a department, we're in the middle of, st- of strategic planning right now for the next five years. But, um, I, I've shared with our staff multiple times, m- probably more so than any other period, um, in our history, we got to be willing to, to change and, and move that plan because, that line item of student athlete benefit, rev share, compensation, employment, whatever you want to call it, um, that's going to be a very critical uh, line item to be able to fund and afford if we're going to remain highly competitive. And, and at West Virginia uh, University, that's the expectation. And so, as the decisions we're making today, we're doing that with an intention, intentionality. Um, understanding that in the not too distant future, that's going to be a reality for us. What a great segment as always. Ren, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Good luck moving forward. It looks like West Virginia's got everything rolling and uh, the facilities and coaching changes and searches and all of that. Congratulations on what you've done. We appreciate it. By the way, someone in our chat, uh, I'm Ren, in Ren we trust. Go Mountaineers. That's from S. Michael DeHart. Great interview, you all, with WVU Scott. Thank you, Ren. Thanks for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Hey, I appreciate you guys. And, Smokey, let me tell you something. Uh, I, I want you to send me some uh, some Texas barbecue. It can even be something that you've made uh, because oh. we have great Italian food here. I mean, I have found some great steak, um, but but I don't know that the barbecue here is as good as Texas. I don't so think it is. Cool. No. That's my only payment. Just just load up some barbecue. And, and <laughs> I, I will. I'm going to do that, and then we can go play Greenbrier. How about that? I'll, right. I'll drive That's across good. the country to bring you some of this brisket and barbecue, and we'll go play the great, great course. Uh, S. Michael DeHart has told me I've got an open invitation. Thank you, Ren. We will do that. Right. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Ren Baker. All he wants is good barbecue. I, I don't blame him. I mean, I mean you there, know, there's uh, always the argument about Kansas City. Then there's the South, and then there's Texas. It's it's different. Like, everything's different, right? And it just depends on your personal taste. I don't think that there's – and I know people in Texas may punch me for saying this, but, I mean, Kansas City's great. Texas is great. You know, Alabama, I've had some great stuff in Alabama and Mississippi. I mean, it, it's good. It just depends on does it taste good? Is it to your taste? Um, you know, North Carolina stuff is, uh, you know, this kind of hit or miss more, for me. Is that more Like vinegar pork? and the pulled yeah, pork yeah. and the, the whole hog barbecue. It's just fine. Um, it's just not, you know, if I had the option of the, you know, barbecue around the world. You I'm would gonna, eat all of it. Yeah, I would. But, like, I would <laughs> I would start in Texas and Kansas City before I went anywhere else. But, yeah, no, you miss it. Like, I, I have a friend from New York that um, – that you know lived in Florida, you know, for, for forever, and he just never. He said, "I can never find good pizza here, even though there's New Yorkers. Like I can't. Oh, really? I can never yeah. find because it's not the way it tastes there. Um, you know, I, I remember when we went to New York. I asked somebody what I should have, and they said you should have Chinese food. And I'm like, well, I've had Chinese food. They're like, no, <laughs> you need to go have Chinese food in Chinatown, which we did. It was absolutely remarkable. Same thing when I was in San Francisco. I had an egg roll that I thought I was going to pass out. It's just different. You Stop. Know? Yeah, it was so good. Stop. It was so good. I was like, I was just walking around in Chinatown, and I was like, oh, look, egg roll. And I had it. I was like, man. Now you got this the is chat way better. room. Now Ren's got the chat room going. Big mm-hmm. rib versus tiny bones. Uh, Texas brisket with a big muscle. Uh, brisket sounds good. Sausage too. Baked beans. Paul, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, all right. When we come back, it, it, we're we're waiting. One of the reasons we're here was to cover the Big 12 Pro Day. One of the other reasons is that we had a good chance. We're going to get Brett Yormark, the commissioner. He's in the building, so he has not like left the building. We still have interviews that we did from earlier today, and we'll have some of those that we don't use today tomorrow, including UCF quarterback John Rice Plumley. Uh, Among others, Phillip Brooks at Kansas State, Isaac Rex, the tight end from BYU, who told us when we met him that he watches and is a subscriber of 365 Sports on YouTube. Are you? If you aren't, please subscribe if you don't mind. Also hit the like button if you don't mind either. This is 365 Sports Live in Frisco. 
It's Dodge Power Shot Days at Allen Samuels in Waco. Experience the adrenaline pumping performance and cutting edge technology of Dodge. From the sleek and stylish 2023 Charger to the performance and muscle of a Challenger to the bold and rugged Durango. During Dodge Power Shot Days, we're offering amazing deals and special incentives that will make driving a new Dodge even more exhilarating. Don't miss out on these exclusive savings. Visit Allen Samuels in Waco today and unleash the power of Dodge. Come by. Let's be friends. You want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. It's pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy, and, you know, I bring my kids, and my kids love being here, too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> Staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home. It's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here, and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more at stonewood-dental.com. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. TFNB Your Bank for Life is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texans are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge Checking and Savings accounts to earn interest or cash back. With five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app, banking has never been easier. TFNB Your Bank for Life. Member FDIC. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. We have had John Rice Plumley on. You see a quarterback uh, many times. It has always been fun. We had you on at Big 12 Media Days. Javon Baker was on with us. Everything you do, and that he likes to win everything he competes in, sure. and so sometimes he's avoided you. Well, sometimes we team up, too. We've, we've, we've been known to play some, some 2v2 ping pong in the locker room, and I oftentimes <laughs> find myself on a team with Javon, and, and we're, we're usually running through the locker room, right, getting beating all those guys. And so, um, again, ultra competitor, just like Javon is. And so um, when two guys like to win, we usually find each other. So is that like you decide we got to make an alliance? Sure. Because That's otherwise right. you're just going to – Run each other to the ground. We can make a two-headed monster here that yeah. we can really win with. So let's do it. And so, uh, yeah, Javon's a stud, and, and uh, appreciate his kind words as well. What is uh, today like? What is uh, this like to be able to show off your skills in front of a lot of people that are looking for talent? Yeah, uh, extremely fun, right? Extremely blessed to do it, too. Um, it's kind of felt like a game day, right? Like you, you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, and then here comes the big day. It's showtime. Let's let's go. And so um, it kind of felt just, just like, like that. that. And so uh, you, you get, get the, the game day journaling going, going again. again. And so uh, really, really appreciate the opportunity the Big 12 put together for us to, to do this. Um, today was awesome. I feel like I did uh, made myself a, a pretty good day here. And so um, that's what I came to do. Came to raise some eyebrows, and hope we did that. So what has this process been like for you so far, just navigating the workouts and, I'm sure, visits and just going through all this process? Um, how much did you kind of know and what to expect beforehand, and, and what's the experience been like up to this point? Yeah, been really, really good, um, right? Kind of taking it as it comes, right, learning learning as I go. And, and uh, some guys that have really been a help is Jeff Christensen, my quarterback coach. I'm actually staying with him in, in, in uh, one of his rooms and um, at his house, and we've been throwing every day, working out at Exos with Brent Calloway and Rock and all them. And uh, they've done me a, a great job, and Dwayne and Gary and all those uh, on the lifting side. So, right, you're still training 
to be big, fast, and strong, and then throw in with Jeff. And another guy that's been a really big key piece in this is actually Trey Lance. Um, he, okay. he trains with uh, Jeff Christensen, and we have we've thrown every day um, uh, together. And he's and he is giving me bits and nuggets of wisdom when his when he was coming through this. And uh, looks a little different because when he was coming through it, he was. Uh, it was during COVID, so uh, a little bit different, right? Yeah. A little, little bit of different dynamic, um, but have learned a lot from him already, and uh, he's a really, really good dude and a great, great friend. friend. So, so you uh, uh, are not playing baseball this year, right? Not, not this is, year, yeah. Is that, is that kind of – I know you have to focus on this process because it's yeah. such a different thing, but as a competitor and a guy who I know loves that game so yeah. much, is it kind of killing you? Uh, yeah, so there's a, bitter, <laughs> there's a bittersweet to it for sure, yeah. right? You see your boys out playing. You see us playing really good baseball right now, and so um, knowing that – like, hey, man, I could be out there with those guys. It kind of eats at you a little bit. But I uh, made the decision to follow my, my dream of playing in the NFL, and that, that's a big commitment, right? And so um, I, I went all in with it, and, and, and I hope it pays off. It's paying off right now, and so enjoying the process for sure. Could you Bo Jackson this thing, Deion Sanders? Hey, there's, there, there might be a, 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 a play down the road. We'll see. We'll see, right? <laughs> your versatility, how much does that play into perhaps your value as a quarterback and the fact that you're, you are – uh, a multi-sport athlete is that's you could maybe even play other positions special teams how much does that help you yeah i think i think if you call a guy an athlete it's a compliment it's yep. always a compliment right and i've been hearing that about guys calling me an athlete so i'll take, take it, it every time i'll take, take it and run with it um but at the end of the day i think whatever gets you in the door gets you in the door mm -hmm. and then when opportunities arise it's what you do with it right um and, and i also have the confidence the uber confidence in myself to believe that i could be one of the best 32 quarterbacks in the world without a doubt uh but again it's about getting in the door first right mm -hmm. and so if that means playing special teams running down on a kickoff let's do it let's rock and roll whatever whatever it looks like to get in the door and then when opportunity arises you make the most of it that's how it's been always uh Going up through middle school to high school to college, I've always taken opportunities when they when they came my way. So if I say athlete, that's not a that's not a, a, a sh an insult, is it? No, that's, it's not a bad because you, you're a quarterback. Yeah, I'm a quarterback. Well, I, I think that, but the flexibility of what you bring to the table. John Rice knows who he is. He knows yeah. who he is. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. John Rice Plumley with us, UCF quarterback, with us at the Big Twelve Pro Day in Frisco on three sixty five Sports. What? Um, look. It, not to knock your size, sure. but they've supersized a quarterback sure. this year with KJ Jefferson. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's a little bit bigger than him. Yeah. Uh, what, what's, what do you think that's going to be like, him and Gus's system, knowing that, look, he's probably the closest physical comp to Cam Newton. 100%, and right? And that worked out pretty well for Gus. It did. It did, <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, KJ's an awesome quarterback, awesome dude. Obviously, you can tell by his physique that he's a beast, mm -hmm. right? Um, watched some of his film when he was in Arkansas, and he's a baller, right? We uh, – we actually played uh, in the same Mississippi-Alabama game coming out oh, of really? high school. We graduated in 2019. We were roommates, uh, played, played in the Mississippi-Alabama game. We won that game, Mississippi. Let's go sit yep. uh, <laughs> And then, uh, obviously, I went to Ole Miss. He goes to Arkansas. We both now are going to be ending up at UCF. I think it's going to be a great spot for him, and I know Coach Malzahn is going to do great things with him. What did you think of the first year in the Big 12? Like, just What was that like for UCF uh, as a program for you? And just uh, what, what did you learn from that, you think, as a program? program and and how do you feel about moving forward yeah I, i'm excited for ucf moving forward to the big 12 uh first year obviously had some growing pains uh especially when the when the injury bug bites you it yeah. makes it tough but hey that's football right everybody everybody gets hurt everybody gets kind of banged up and it's about what you do to to, to continue going right and so um we we toughed it out we played some tough games right had some tough losses there at the end when it came down to it uh would love to to get those back and and, and win all of those right but hindsight's 2020 uh moving forward i think they did a great job in the portal getting pieces that we needed um, and then obviously high school recruiting around Florida is like Florida football is real deal, yeah. right? So if you can keep those kids at UCF, we're going to be a good spot. John Rice Plumley, UCF with us at Pro Day, Big 12 Pro Day in Frisco. This is 365 Sports. Looking to connect with Baylor alums in your area? Baylor alumni can help. Looking to host a watch party in your city? Baylor alumni can get you started. Want to step out in your community and serve with other alums? Baylor alumni is your connection with the university and each other. Let's get started. Learn how at baylor.edu slash alumni. 
Thank you for calling your local Marco's Pizza. We're turning up the heat with our new Reaper Cheesy Bread. Fresh, house-made dough is topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers. At only $5.99, this limited-time product is a hot deal. Add it to your order while you can. A Marco's team member will be with you shortly. Marco's Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. And that offer on the Reaper Cheesy Bread is available right now at any of the five Marco's Pizza locations in Waco, including Bell Mead, China Spring, Robinson, in Woodway and Hewitt. Order online at Marcos.com. Call for a pickup or delivery. Marcos Pizza is turning up the heat with their all-new Reaper Cheesy Bread with fresh, hot, house-made dough topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers and only $5.99 and for a limited time only. Marcos Pizza, the fastest-growing pizza brand in America, five locations in Waco, and the new Reaper Cheesy Bread. Marcos Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Niche Group Insurance Agency. With the Niche Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Niche Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Niche Group at 1-800-258-8302. Did you know that one out of every four men have symptomatic low levels of testosterone and don't even know it? And if you think you're too young to worry about it, guess again. Low T levels can make you feel tired and grumpy. Raise your cholesterol and cause weight gain. Petty Clinic Low T can set up same day blood screening and results. So if you're tired of being tired, call or go online at PettyClinicLowT.com. It's a private clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Affordable, only $165 a month, including lab work, office consultation, testosterone injections, and follow up visits. Compared, to $300 or more a month in Dallas or Austin, and you don't have to drive 90 miles one way or the other and fight the traffic. Petty Clinic Low T has board-certified physician consultations and will provide the best form of brand-strength testosterone. Contact Petty Clinic Low T for increased energy, improvement in sexual desire and performance, mood, concentration, even a decrease in body and belly fat. Just off Highway 84 and Old Hewitt Drive in Woodway, PettyClinicLowT.com. This is 365 Sports. Text us at 254-339-1122. The text line is sponsored by Riverbend Liquor and Wine with the most extensive variety of craft beer in Waco. A hidden gem on Lakeshore Drive and 19th Street. We apologize for the audio of John Rice Plumley. We'll see if we can get that corrected. We're live at the... Uh... Ford Center. It's a star Cowboys facility, Cowboys headquarters in Frisco. The NFL Network is going to showcase today, um, tonight at 7 o'clock and also tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. They'll have the highlights of particular drills, the 40, et cetera, interviews, et cetera, profiles. They'll do that tonight at 7 on the NFL Network and also uh, they'll do it tomorrow night, too. So whatever you wanted to watch, they'll break it down, probably some of the bigger names or also some of the performances that got most people talking. I did mention this earlier in case you did not see it. 32 teams, all 32 NFL teams have been represented today and are here today, scouts from each of those teams. And some schools, some teams have multiple scouts, too. All right, so, so you guys tell me where you want to go. All right, let's 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 go ahead and play – Isaac Rex, if you can, you can't get it up or yeah, give a second. And then if it, let me see if I can fix the issue. Cause I, I need to do it where I can hear it uh, or you guys can hear it. Otherwise I can't fix it. <laughs> well, how are we going to play it if it's not fixed? Uh, well, I can't know if it's not fixed until we play it. It's, okay. it's, 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 it's kind of backwards. Yes. It's one hell of a catch 22. And I realize how effed that is, but we are where we are. So, okay. all right. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll be over there, Garrett. All right. So this it. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, all right. BYU, BYU tight end Isaac, Isaac Rex with us on 365 Sports at Pro Days here in Frisco with the Big 12. And a viewer of our show. That I was, am a viewer. A I'm, I'm a subscriber on YouTube. Um, you know, I check you guys out all the time, especially the conference realignment, um, you know, whole fiasco back in the day. Oh. You guys were on top of it. Any any rumor you guys heard, you guys were covering it. So right. I, I loved watching it. It was awesome. What was that like as a player going through the unknown or whatever the future was going to be? 
Well, it was definitely interesting in terms of, you know, one week you're in the Big 12, the next week Arizona's in the Big 12, and then Utah's in the Big 12, Arizona State, and then the whole Pac-12 is, you know, going to the Big 10, and now there's only two teams in the Pac-12. Just a crazy situation, but, you know, I'm glad BYU found their home early because, man, you would not want to be stuck in that. How exciting was it to be a part of that for BYU, like to, to be a part of that era? I know that this year was, you know, a little bit rocky at times, but still, you guys, you know, the momentum that you have as, as a university is pretty huge. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, I, I think back in the day, it was uh, 2021, they announced it. And then that uh, Saturday, we beat Utah. So it was like <laughs> the best weekend in BYU sports history, I, I feel like. Uh, we broke the streak, and then we uh, also, you know, got in the Big 12. So that was probably one of the best days in BYU history, probably, besides the national championship. We know there's there's no love lost between the two programs, but uh, how do you feel about being conference mates, BYU and Utah? Oh, I think it's awesome. I mean, to be back in the conference with Utah is so cool, and then you have that rival up north that hopefully, you know, you could be playing for something that means more than just, you know, a game, but uh, something that – can lead to a conference championship, a Big 12 championship. And so, you know, it's I think it's awesome that BYU has, you know, a neighbor in Utah to be in the Big 12 with. What's How rowdy is it in that game between the two fan bases? <laughs> I sadly only played in once. So yeah. uh, I, I played in 2021, um, and it was at home, it was at BYU, and luckily we were on the winning side. But it is uh, it's intense. I mean, everyone up north – it's big Utah fans. My in-laws are huge Utah fans, actually. Oh, really? So there's even, like, you know, family feuds that go on within uh, uh, B- uh, BYU and Utah families. So oh. it, it's a big deal over there. That game with Baylor last year when you won an over, double overtime, I think it was, everyone that went to that game in, 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 uh, in Provo came back. They could not discuss the atmosphere enough. Uh, could you try <laughs> to describe the atmosphere of a night game especially? Oh, yeah. I mean, a night game, I feel like BYU has probably the biggest, you know, maybe on the West Coast, home field advantage for those night games. Our student section is top-notch the rock. They go crazy. You know, you've seen it probably a thousand times of uh, other teams getting false starts or, you know, offsides because it's hard to hear. Like, (laughs) you can't hear it when you're on the student section because they're so crazy. They're so wild. And, um, yeah, BYU's fans are, are amazing. How's your health? How's everything coming in these workouts? I know you had to come over, uh, get over some injuries. I watched you run the 40 uh, earlier, doing some stretching exercise I don't think I've ever seen before, uh, <laughs> making sure you're ready to go. How did you feel everything went today? It was good. I mean, I, I, I feel like I wish my times were a little bit better. You know, that, a couple of the – a lot of the tight ends felt like, you know, it was maybe a little slower than anticipated. But, you know, that's just how it goes, and you can't dwell on it too much. And now it's time to, you know, focus on football and – um, get in good football shape. So, Has the NFL always been like the lifelong dream for you? Uh, has that always been on the radar first and, and foremost, I guess? Yeah, no, that's been uh, probably my, my goal ever since I was a kid to, you know, make an NFL roster to contribute to the team. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm a good enough player that I could come in and help a team, whether that's in blocking situations, special teams, or, you know, on, on an offensive side of the ball. So, um, yeah, that's always been a dream of mine, and hopefully I can achieve that goal. And your father was pretty good at BYU, huh? He was good, man, All-American back in the day. Um, yeah, and so he uh, brainwashed me into uh, going to BYU and also my little <laughs> brother. Um, so my little brother's a safety right there, Preston. And, and you have a son that's a year and a half? Or, oh, a, year oh, oh, a year yeah, old. A year What's old. A year old next week. What's that like, juggling <laughs> all that? Yeah, so it's his birthday next week, Luca, and he is a cute little kid. He's starting to walk, so... I haven't seen him in probably 10 days because my wife went out to Provo um, or she went out to Utah the other right. day. And so I'm excited, you know, to see him again and hang Luca? out with him. Luca, Luca, yep. Luca Doncic name, or is there a well, different? Uh, I mean, it's a Hawaiian name, actually. It's a, okay. it's a, it's a name <laughs> that's, uh, you know, a lot of different nationalities have. Yeah. Like it's Eastern European mm-hmm. and it's actually Hawaiian for, for Luke. And so my grandma's Hawaiian, so I kind of keep that. Cool culture within uh, our family and yeah i mean luca he's he's the cutest little kid so uh, isaac rex a tight end byu with us on 365 sports you speak fluent samoan i do <laughs> yeah if that is that something that kind of just came natural because of your lineage or no i served my mission and uh i served my mission samoa so i uh, was there for two years uh on a rural island you know in the middle of the pacific 
and it was definitely a, a crazy experience, but it was a really cool experience too. Well, there, I mean, it's beautiful out there. I it's mean, really, yeah, it's, it's really, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that, like, you know, you're not, you're not just there on the beach. You're, yeah, you're yeah. doing some work there. But uh, how how hard was it to pick up? It, it took me about a year for yeah. sure. Um, it's a different language in terms of it's pretty simple. Um, you know, English is so complex. Like, there's so many different words. In you know the Samoan language, there's not a ton of words, but you know you could use it in different ways. So it was definitely hard to pick up, but it was a cool. I, I was in Hawaii the last two years. Uh, I got engaged in, in oh, Hawaii nice. and on Kauai, and I got married on Oahu last year. Yeah. Uh, and the thing I thought was really cool about the culture is that they're so uh, connected to their home. Like yeah, it's, it's very, exactly, yep. it's very unique and not in a way like people from Texas are proud of from Texas. People are proud, but like, it's, it's a completely, it's almost hard to explain, right? Yeah. About no. how connected they are to Hawaii or to Samoa or wherever they are from. Yeah. I mean, that's the homeland for them. And yeah. you know, I have, there's a ton of Polynesians on the team mm -hmm. and you know, Polys are very family oriented mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, their, uh, the grandmas live in the house, you know, <laughs> the, the little kids in the house, like it, they're, they're not kicking them out, sending them to old folks' homes. You yeah. know, it's uh, they're very family oriented. What are your expectations over the next month between now and the draft, and then whatever happens after that? Yeah, I feel like my expectations are, you know, I I want to just whatever team you know is willing to take a chance on me, I I would love to, you know, get that chance, and then you know it, it's straight football from there. So I'll be competing in in OTAs and. And rookie mini camp, and yeah, it's going to be uh, definitely a grind, but a cool experience. The, uh, everybody who we've had on, we've had like a half a dozen players along with you, has tried to. Uh, they can't say enough about this experience with what the Big 12 has done, the Omni, the facilities, and the moment. How would you describe what this week has been like for you? No, it's been really cool. I mean, to stay at such a nice hotel and to. Uh, you know, perform at a great stadium. Uh, I was here for the Shrine Bowl, and so I was able to get acquainted with Frisco a little. And Frisco is a, a, you know, a great little town, and there's a lot of good food around, and, you know, it's like a lot of good um, things to see and, and go do. So, yeah, I mean, like, this experience has been great, and I can't thank the Big 12 enough. W would you believe that 20 years ago there was nothing here? Maybe not even that long <laughs> ago. Nothing. This like, like really? One, if one high school, now there's 12. There were no Jeez. buildings. It was like a bunch of high wheat fields or whatever, yeah. corn. And now you've got this, like, massive city pulling itself well, out of the well, dirt. When yeah. I say nothing, this is where people ran from the law. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, like, <laughs> I didn't realize that. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not a Texas guy. Yeah. I'm, uh, I don't really have any affiliation with Texas, but... You know, I, it's a great time. I, I, I wouldn't be opposed to moving here one day. We had Kalani Sataki on the show, in fact, yesterday. How would you discuss him as a coach, as a man, and what he's meant to the program as a former player himself? Oh, I love Kalani. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think there's a better coach out there. He is uh, a great head coach. He loves the players. He loves, uh, you know, the fans, the the faculty. He's, he's a great overall coach, and, you know, I, I wish our – season went a little bit better and he gets some hate maybe he doesn't deserve but Kalani is he's a top top notch guy and he's a, a, a great leader for BYU well thank you for your time good luck man no, Isaac, thank you guys thanks appreciate for it subscribing <laughs> no, yeah. Isaac Rex BYU <laughs> tight end and we're in Frisco and this is 365 sports uh we just got an update on Brett Yormark that we, we should we will have him before we end this show it was uh, scheduled for right off the top but we will have him just heard for the big 12 uh, administration on that so we are waiting on that when that comes and we'll have him when we get him uh, by the way um, Notre Dame's AD we are now as in good a position as we've ever been in the modern era of college football to be independent you see all the conference realignment you see everything that's happened I think our position as being independent in football quite frankly is certainly more unique than ever but also more valuable than ever that from actually Pete Bavakwa, the first-year AD who took over for Jack Swarbuck. I, I don't know uh, what's happened that would have changed that. Like, none of the rules, especially since Jack Swarbrick, uh was the one who helped, you know, create the 12-team playoff in the first place. Uh, and, you know, there's carve-outs for Notre Dame, and they – 
they have a minor concession of they'll never get a first round bye because they won't be a conference champion. But who knows how long that sticks? What if the first round buys just wind up going to the top four ranked teams, you know, and conference champions are just guaranteed that they go in, uh, you know, and things like that. There could be lots of different things down the line. And Notre Dame has played this as strong as anybody can play it. Then the only question that they're going to have going forward in their athletic department is what conference do you park the rest of your sports in? That's it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I've never bought into the Notre Dame football will be forced to join the Big Ten narrative that's been out there for at least a couple of years, if not probably longer than that. But a couple of years is how long I've seemingly noticed it uh, pretty consistently. And I understand there's things that could come into play to, to try and force their hand. We mentioned it yesterday, scheduling. If you blocked out all the opponents in the SEC and the Big Ten, and they had to come up with a schedule. Well, guess what? You think the Big 12 wouldn't line up and be like, hey, let's make an arrangement. Uh, if you want to play your football games here conference-wise or you know, play, or you want to find opponents, we can figure that out for you and you park the rest of your sports here. You think Brett Yormark would sign up for that? Uh, yeah, he would. Um, the ACC obviously already has an arrangement, um, but football independence, I think, is not sustainable, obviously, for certain other brands, but for Notre Dame, it is, and it never made sense to me that they would be – uh, forced to do really anything um so yeah outside of a bunch of schools coming together and say we're going to block out them from scheduling any of us even then i don't know if they wouldn't find a way around that to maintain what they have because what they have is pretty dang good um but you know that's not going to stop people from uh, assuming that they're going to be forced to make a decision one day but i don't know it's pretty as adamant as it's going to get from an athletic director uh outright saying that they value their independence and it's the best you know situation they could be in so you know um that's that speaks volumes to me and i know sometimes somebody says something and you immediately poke holes in it but i think in this case he's he's saying what's real and uh they're going to be independent until there's just absolutely no feasible way for them to not be independent one note in this article by heather denich of espn is that the new six-year college football playoff agreement which begins in 26 Notre Dame has the potential to earn roughly $18 million annually, which would significantly elevate the program closer to what the Big Ten and SEC schools are making. It would also then put them ahead of both the ACC and the Big 12. Yeah. So there's, there's again, there's you accumulate some money along the way with the college football playoff, and they don't have to share any of it. No. It's theirs, all yeah. of it, everything they get. There's no splitting it with anybody else. They get the whole, the full meal deal. Okay, we're about to have Brett Yormark on. He is in charge of 16 schools. Uh, he has the same amount of power, uh, if not, I don't know, like, you know, how it breaks down, but as Pete Bavacqua does, who's in charge of a school. One school. One school. Yeah, That's his, it. His school. So. Yeah, yeah, he – he is the commissioner, basically, athletic commissioner uh, for one school, one conference called Notre Dame, no matter the connection with what they do with the ACC. So uh, Notre Dame right now expected to get $12 million from the college football revenue. Same ballpark, of course, is the ACC with $13 million plus in the Big 12 with $12 million plus, but more incentives. He didn't go into what they were, but the possibility – of about a $6 million financial incentive for any independent team that reaches the college football playoff. I uh, agreed with what Ren Baker said when he's, he said, like, you know, to determine before you even started, like, instead of just having, like, if you get this many teams in, like the, like, the thing is the model exists. We're, we're living it right now in the NCAA tournament. The more teams you have win, the more units you get, and you get those things. So I don't understand why, um, you know, if they're trying to make basketball more like football, why can't they make football more like basketball uh, and enhance those things? You know, that the postseason in basketball is the best. The regular season in football is the best. Why not take your time, enhance the postseason in football, and then enhance the regular season in basketball? It seems like they don't know really what their issues are or they're trying to solve them upside down. Yeah, there's another part to um – of his comments that uh, pertain to the ACC and them being, you know, very much in flux right now. And uh, he talked about the totality of the three elements that they have when it comes to revenue, um, putting them in the stronger position than they've ever been. It's the NBC relationship, it's the CFP money, and it's the ACC network relationship. So one of those in the ACC network's case is a little bit flimsy 
potentially uh, looking at what could happen in the future. And I know there was more activity, you know, last night uh, with Florida State filed another. What was that? What do you consider that? Um, a motion? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess. I thought they tweaked the one that they originally yeah, filed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the language in it was different in that they're just saying, like, when we leave was the <laughs> big, I guess, notable aspect of that was it's gone from leaving it what you know somewhat vague or open to flat out saying in that like when when florida state leaves the acc when florida state's gone from the acc it just says it like it's it's happening and it's or it's already Not happened if. It yeah went, there's yeah, no if yeah. to it in their language now they've bypassed the if so i mean florida state's leaving that's that's pretty well known at this point it's just the particulars of that of when and and where um and it sure appears that clemson is as well so point being that you've got that going on so how could the acc network be all that strong here in the near future he said clearly like everybody else we're certainly talking about fsu and clemson with the conference and jim phillips but we feel the conference is in such great shape has a long-term relationship with espn which is important and has secured its very important inclusion in the cfp like we have for the next eight years there's a lot of unbelievably great things going on for the ACC and we value our relationship and being a part of that conference and the overwhelming majority of our sports with the two exceptions obviously football and hockey so uh, there he is with a you know a vote of confidence I guess you could say for the ACC which has not been uh, very common here lately but that do think that's notable uh, coming from Mm -hmm. Notre Dame so there's a a, a little bit of an update because it's always like yeah but what about Notre Dame and I think most of us I mean, you don't know anymore because how much changed in college athletics, college football, et cetera. But for the most part, I don't think any of us ever see Notre Dame being forced to do anything until, like you mentioned, they have no choice. Like, for example, who's go- who they're going to play. Or if it gets to the point where the money is so detrimental or they're blocked out of getting the money or being a part of a championship. Those are That's basically it. And, and all of that by uh, uh, Bavakwa today. Uh, was at, was at least uh, in a quote ESPN article by Heather Denich from there. All right, the uh, Big 12 Pro Days continues here at the Ford Center inside the Star. Uh, this is Cowboys facility. We kind of sometimes, and we've said we're in Frisco, Texas, which is just north of Dallas. This is a monstrosity of a, of a structure. You have the main administration headquarters of what is the Cowboys. Then you have this stadium, which is indoor uh, facility, but also a football stadium. And then in between that, you have the facilities, uh, locker rooms, everything you could imagine to run an NFL franchise in between the two buildings and down below as well on so, this floor and below. So the front of the building is the Cowboys offices and uh, some other businesses that are here uh, that rent in the star. The back of the building is now Keurig Dr. Pepper. And that's where their offices are, which is, as you know, a gigantic, massive company. Uh, And then not to mention that uh, even though it's now pretty new, uh, there's an Omni Hotel attached to this uh, right here. This is where we had to come in today. Right on the hip of the the stadium we're in. Yeah, Yeah. so you can come and stay. If you really want to immerse yourself in all things Jerry Jones, come to Frisco, Texas. And on the back side of this, on the northern side of the building, there are football fields where they practice, mm-hmm. uh, along with all the facilities they need uh, as, a, as an NFL franchise, too. All right, we're live in Frisco. Hey, I wanted to pass on one. Uh, Bev- Bevacqua said it's, Bevacqua. Fun- uh, Bevacqua, it's fundamentally important to Notre Dame to stay independent in football. That's an exact quote. It's fundamentally important to Notre Dame to stay independent in football because it has allowed the school to position itself as a national university as it relates to football. So I just wanted to pass that line. All, I mean, he pretty much already said all that, but that's just another just like straight to the point line. Um, so, you know, again, down the line, I, there, there's nothing that stops speculation. Like there's, there's no like you could say never and then it's just you move on from it. So there will always be the Notre Dame. Eventually they'll be forced into. But right now, even with the ACC on shaky ground, it seems like they're being pretty clear. And look, things could always change, but I, I don't know. I still feel pretty confident like I have been pretty much all along that Notre Dame right now at least isn't going to be forced to doing anything and not in the near future it looks like either. Before we do break, I want to bring up um... – Kirk Schultz at Washington State. Pat Shun took the job with rival Washington. Um, Kirk Schultz has been under a lot of pressure, some of it, by the way, that helped create because of presidents and uh, Commissioner um, Klyovkov or whatever, when the Pac-12 eventually just 
evaporated other than Oregon State and Washington State. But Pat Chun taking the job as the AD at Washington State to take the job at Washington because that became open because Troy Dannon is now at Nebraska. He has just gone scorched earth on Pat Chun. Do you guys have any problem with Pat Chun going from Washington State with all of what they're going through to take the job at a place that is now a part of the Big Ten, as stable as they've ever been before? Is that something that would have been – would some people have said no to that? Maybe. But, I mean, Uh, he is going scorched earth on Pat Chun taking that job. If it had been Minnesota, Iowa, whoever, I would have understood it. But – what in the holy all whatever he said uh, he didn't want to be quoted but it basically you're blanking kidding me well i mean like yes i know it stings but i mean the reality of the situation is what it is and you know (laughs) are you like it's not like players haven't played for the cowboys and eagles or you know the transfer portal exists and you know play like jabbar muhammad has played for oregon and washington or washington and oregon like that would never happen before, ever. So for an AD to go, coaches. Kalani Sataki went to BYU, coached at Utah, coaches at BYU. Like, I, I get it, like, that you're upset and that it's going to be hard to get another AD in there, that it's of, of Pat Chun's stature, given the tumultuous future that Washington State has. But, dude, you, I mean, like, if, you, if it was you, if Washington called up and needed a president, would you say no? I don't know if he would. There's a partial quote, and I didn't. I, I read as much as I could on it, where he said, "I don't plan on leaving until we get this thing righted. I don't feel. I don't see. I don't know how many more years I have of this," which to me was like he could leave in a year. I mean, what if he just goes? Are they going to have it fixed in a year? Maybe. But I. I just thought. I just. Uh, I get the frustration. I get you could be very angry, but to go and out and say it. I don't understand what that does. I don't know if Pat Chun did anything wrong. Yes, it's a rival. Yes, hard times in Wazoo. But that seemed to me as if Kirk Schultz is taking out all of the frustration, of which part of it has to be on his shoulders too, and slamming it on Pat Chun. Yeah, look, how many, not even in sports, like how many times do you, you get an offer from a competing firm in whatever job you do and take it because it's more money and a more stable future? It has nothing to do with the way that you feel or about anybody there. You got to look out for you. And if you want to be the AD at Washington because it's a better job for you, then go be the AD at Washington. Like it, to me, like it's it, okay. Kirk Schultz better stay there for a good long while and not go take another job if somebody calls him up. And maybe they won't now because he's been so publicly. He'll say, what's the wrong? appeal at yeah, this yeah. point? Right? Yeah, I don't know what the appeal of Kirk Schultz is, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I like. It's just weird that you would, you know, not just keep it, you know, buttoned up a little bit. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's just mounting frustrations. Probably yeah. you lost your basketball coach. You lost your football coach. You won your lawsuit. I mean, settled it. And that was obviously good news. But, you know, now your athletic director leaves. And so there's another thing. And in the midst of the craziest athletic time that I'm aware of, at least in that school's history. So, yeah, I think just maybe frustrations boiling over, and I don't know what what kind of relationship did he have with Pat Chun. Yeah, we don't know what they talked about behind the scenes. We don't know. He said they talked every day for six years. Uh, now again, uh, it looks but I like mean, it more might've... like we don't know what they said to each no. other. Like we don't know if Pat Chun one day was like, "I'm going to be here and fight through this to the very end with you guys," and then you know he turns around and takes a job. And if that's the case, I could understand more. But not being privy to those conversations, you know, just sounds like a guy who's. Um, a bit fed up probably from uh, just the hurdles that keep getting thrown in, in their way uh, up in Pullman. And it's just a little bit, uh, I don't know, it sounds like angry. And, and the, the word that he used, disappointed. So um, could he have handled that better or more professional? Certainly. But I, I can also see where uh, you're not exactly in, you know, the, the most professional mindset now as far as just you know one thing after the other after the other and again it, it might have been a bit more personal because it's a guy he talked to every single day and thought was going to be along for the ride for for settling this thing uh and, and getting it str- squared up and where it needs to be moving forward and, and now he's gone too so yeah definitely frustration boiling over it seems like all right the retired stockbroker thank you for the super chat good luck to houston this weekend uh, Roger Dodger, he's just jumping off a sinking boat. Uh, I mean, that's obviously, yeah, what, what probably most people are going to think that aren't, 
you know, Washington State fans or, or those that want to sympathize with them. I mean, I certainly do to an extent. I also know that um, these things, you know, teams moving conferences, teams taking a hit, you know, coaches leaving, that's all part of it. And I'm seeing kind of the same reactions I see for every other time a coach leaves. Like, oh, my God, I thought you were going to be here for 25 years. I can't believe you're leaving us. It's like, I don't know. I just I, I don't. I just think that's part of the deal. And, you know, Washington State's in a position where if you're a coach and you got a better opportunity that's more secure and it's more uh, of a long-term bet, then, you know, you, just like players uh, or just like Rim Baker's talking about, you're going to do what you got to do for yourself. Uh, and you don't owe Washington State necessarily anything. But, again, I, I, I don't know all the ins and outs there, but there's there's obviously some frustration. And, and you know, Pat Jun went and took a, a really good job. So, We'll see what uh, Washington State can now do as far as finding an athletic director. UW fan Jim is a Huskies fan. Uh, I'm pulling for WSU, but they are really blaming us for all of their problems. Yes, we did, by the way. S. Michael DeHart, we didn't mention it's official on Pat Kelsey. We actually spoke about him taking the job at Louisville, but now it is official. Thank you for letting us uh, uh, know that. Uh, and, and then, he's right. Like Washington doesn't have to save them. Oregon doesn't yeah. have to save them. It, uh, he does the same thing as like then the member like a couple weeks ago when there was uh, who was it that was like blaming the Big Twelve for why they don't have a conference. It's like why it's not anybody's job to throw you a life raft. Like yeah. I'm sorry, but guess what? You had a guy in the meeting rooms negotiating the deal that never came to fruition until it was far too late that led directly to the dissolution of the conference. Not. Brett, your mark calling Arizona, not uh, the Big Ten calling, you know, school X or whatever. It, you know, it was it was a situation where they had an abundance of time and there were outside pressures that created a little sense of urgency. But they were the ones time and time again when people were raising the alarms of, oh, it's just BS. And they had their little, you know, uh, uh, I guess little pundits of. Oh, it's just people making up stuff, and it's just clickbait, or it's just it's all lies. And the Pac-12 is fine. The Pac-12 is never going to die, and they believe their own yep. their own stuff is he basically what happened. He was one of the most vocal, exactly right. at propping so up the conference, maybe out of hope, or maybe he thought, but it didn't it didn't happen. Yeah, like uh, and to an extent, his own arrogance bit him in the ass. I mean, for lack of a better term. And so I, I don't like all of the. I mean, I understand it, and especially from fans, that's what fans do. Um, but I think this whole point in the finger of like, oh, it's Washington's fault. It's the Big 12's fault. It's Oregon's fault. It's like it's, it's a little bit of everybody's fault, but it's also your fault as much as anybody's, if not more, because your job is to handle your school. It's not Oregon's job to k- take care of Washington State. Yeah, well, and look, you, you mentioned the TV deal. I mean, I think our early position was like, they've got to get a TV deal done, right? They've got to get a TV deal done. It makes sense. That's all we said and, and then, initially. And then initially, as it got longer and longer, it been like, well, how, like, is Brett Yormark just that good of a negotiator that he got his done? And then yep. the Pac-12, yes, but the Pac-12 didn't go, okay, what did you give them? Can you give us, like, you know, 50 bucks more just so I can I can get a win here? Remember and there was a study that said they were going to get $50, 50 million, yeah. dollars well, and they, they bit it, they he, bit, chewed on it, and thought it was legitimate. Here's, here's what George Klyovkov should have known. When he walked in the room and said fifty million, and they all said no, and then they gave him an offer, and then he said fifty million, and then they said, "Okay, you're not getting how this works here. Um, you give us an offer, we give you an offer, then you come back down, and then we find a, a middle ground of everybody's happy. Uh, that's how this works." And he was like, "Well, we've got a guy that wrote a report that's not anything to do with this. He's just a professor. He doesn't work in the field, but he says that we're worth fifty million dollars, and that's what we want." And then they said, "Well, you probably need to go uh, talk to that guy because he's wrong." And he said, "Now we don't think he is." And then you're like. At the end, like Apple, you are where you are. Apple now. says if you sell enough candy bars, you'll get enough, and then that that was it. Like I, I, like when I was in Pop Warner football, those little boxes at UW gym. I feel for them, but they are in a bad place, and we are the evil ex that kept them. Yeah, that, that yeah. kept the house, and, and I, you're the rival yeah. anyway. So they already don't like you, and they hate you, and so it's just even more reason. And look, I I'm not saying all this to dog on the Cougars, um, not by any means. I just. I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from, and it's it's boiled over maybe in the case of Kirk Schultz after now losing Pat Chung. And uh, I do think that sometimes with the fans at least, uh, there's a little bit too much finger-pointing at 
other conferences, other people that aren't the people who were directly involved in the decision making that led you to where you are. The actual decision makers that got it wrong are at fault more so than Brett Yormark is at fault for basically waiting patiently for you to screw up. And and that's, you know, to, in, in one part of this, exactly what happened was uh, they played the waiting game and waited for a misstep and for people to get a little bit nervous. And we saw what happened with Colorado and then, and, you know, the rest followed. Um, after that, uh, ultimately, when the Big Ten came calling for Oregon and Washington, so you know, there's 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 plenty of blame game to go around. It's an awful position, and uh, I'm you know at least glad for them that they've got options as far as the financial side of things. They could have been in a way worse position, uh, and they've got a two-year period to you know go with the Mountain West in football, see what that looks like, figure out. I know they've figured out the other sports as well for the most part, and so let's just see what that looks like and see where they end up on the other side of it. But uh, I understand that it's it's a bit more than just your typical concern because this really is a feeling of like are we on now the outside looking in like permanently like are did we just get kicked out of the club just us two and everybody else gets to stay in except for us and that doesn't make a lot of sense in anybody's heads probably and that's that hurts uh to see it all just go from what you've known forever and ever to all of a sudden you're in the, not in the same conference really uh, name only and it's just you and one other school and it's uh, in a completely uncertain future so it's it's a weird time you and a, have, a tough time you only have about two years of revenue flow mm -hmm. as you said earlier in the week paul to kind of keep you afloat chung got handed a bag of money and he took it from adam vulture thank you very much oh uh, chun is an ohio state alum he goes i think yeah uh, so he's not a cougar legacy or anything like that uh, if Big 12 ADs and coaches jump ship to the SEC or Big 10, I wouldn't blame them. I'm, not, I'm expecting yeah. it. Like, yeah. I mean, look, I'm sitting there listening to Ren Baker going, he's great for West Virginia, but I'm not going to be surprised if somebody else comes calling. We know with Mac Rhodes, I mean, there's been plenty of schools that have been interested. And in, if he were to have taken, you know, a USC job, for example, or a whatever job, it, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be like, I get it. Yep. Like, I absolutely would get it. I'm not going to, you know, cry over spilt milk. I would totally understand it. You know, if he were to go to TCU, that would be a different story. That'd be one where you'd be like, dude, what or, in the hell? Ren Baker went to Pittsburgh. Or Ren Baker yeah. went to yeah. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Like that, you go like, okay, oh. wait a second. But <laughs> yeah. if he's going to, like, Ohio State, I mean, sorry, well, ears. But when, the, when the Missouri job opened up, right? you know, he had been there before. It wasn't a great experience. But at the same time, I, it would not yeah. have surprised me, you know? Yeah, but, and again, not, nothing, nothing against the – the, the wazoo or the osu folks i i get it man and i don't don't envy that position whatsoever but uh, yeah i mean we we all do what the, what is the best for ourselves that's what these conferences are doing that's what these schools are doing and uh that's what pat chun decided to do and um and many others have made choices that are for the betterment of of their lives or their careers and so that's what i look at it as but you know who knows behind the scenes and on the cougar message boards what the talk is about what was said or you know what the what the feelings are, are really like behind the scenes so without knowing that um you know just based on what we know it's just part of college sports is guys moving on to other gigs and it's just unfortunate timing by the way astros and yankees one of those early games at least they started up astros four three over new york wanted to give you an update on a baseball score or two top of the sixth astros at one point led that game four to nothing and those early games are underway when we come back we continue live from big 12 conference Pro Days inside the, the Ford Center in Frisco, Texas, and we'll be right back in a moment. Our good friend Brad Boozer, Boozer's Jewelers here at 365 Sports. Now, Brad, uh, people who watch uh, and listen to our show know I'm a double-time customer for you, engagement ring and wedding band, and you guys do that great, but that's not all you do at Boozer's Jewelers. Absolutely. And uh, I always like to say, you know, it's a new year. It's a great way to start the year out. Uh, go through your old jewelry, go through your wife's jewelry box, go through anything you're maybe not wearing, something that's broken, something that you're not using. We do a a massive amount of custom work. We can take your old jewelry, old diamonds, old watches, and we can convert it into something special for you and make a one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry. Uh, and if that's not something you're interested in, uh, a great thing is we can turn that into cash. So we buy gold, we buy diamonds, we'll buy Rolex watches, any kind of heirloom jewelry, anything that's maybe passed down to you. Boozer's Jewelers, where do they find you, Brad? We're at 1025 North Valley Mills Drive, right on the corner of Lake Air Drive and Valley Mills with the big clock on the corner. 
Pioneer Steel and Pipe opened their doors in 1943 and they have never wavered with their focus on great product and customer service, relationships with a handshake, making sure you, the customer, is satisfied. Their new facility is now twice the size, allowing new inventory, higher quantities, and in a much more organized fashion. In addition to the long lengths of tubing, angles, channels, rods, and flat Pioneer Steel and Pipe now offer several shorter, more convenient lengths of material already cut. Their 2,500 square foot showroom has over a thousand new products in stock, new welding supplies, hardware, quick creep, and do-it-yourself components for any project, whether you are a professional contractor or weekend warrior. The new facility is designed to make your loading experience faster and more efficient with easy drive lanes around the building and much more room to get your trailer loaded. Our location may have changed, but our values haven't, and our relationship with customers goes much farther than just business. Pioneer Steel and Pipe on Loop 340 and Highway 6 and just east of I-35 in Waco. Alan Samuels House of Travel is a full-service travel agency with highly experienced travel consultants plus support staff with over a combined 150 years in the travel business. They are ready to take care of any travel situation for you, your family, and your business. And with the kind of knowledge to complete a seamless itinerary trip start to finish. They will search for the best deal to accommodate your budget from air to cars, ship to shore, hotel, and even meeting space. Name a destination and they've been there. They know the places to go in international and missionary travel is one of their unique specialties. Alan Samuels House of Travel, celebrating 50 years in business. Call Connie, Sherry, Linda, or Bambi at 254-776-2560 or find them on Facebook or at houseoftravelwaco.com. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Enjoying the show? Hit the like button and subscribe. Philip Brooks, Kansas State wide receiver, return specialist with us on 365 Sports at Big 12, Big 12 Pro Days in Frisco. What's this been like today? What's the experience been like for you? And do you like this setting with what they've done? Um, it's, it's a great opportunity um, as far as being in front of the, all these scouts. Um, you don't get that at a traditional pro day, so... Uh, and then seeing the players and uh, the people you competed against, I think that was good, catching up with them and, and, and uh, uh, networking with them and just talking with them and stuff like that. Um, it was a long day. <laughs> Been here since 530, but, uh, you know, uh, I think once we get another year, a couple more years on this, it'll get rolling smooth. So first time, first time jitters for everything. <laughs> Philip, uh, yesterday was big news for a guy like you who's a kick returner, right? Um, with the kickoff return rule changing, did, did that make you excited about, okay, now like my value has even maybe even gone up a little bit more? No, absolutely. It's a, it's a blessing. Uh, I was just talking with other guys down there. Uh, uh, so much has happened since mm -hmm. I've been in college for six years. Uh, my freshman year, my true freshman year, was the first year that freshmen could play four games and keep their red shirt. Um, COVID happened, so you had an extra year. Uh, NILs happened, and uh, uh, different teams are moving in and out of the, the conference, and now we have the Big 12 Combine, and then the kickoff rule. So it's a lot of change going on. Um, I believe that my adaptability it makes me understand, and I, I think I'll be okay. But uh, when I heard the news, it was absolutely a blessing to see because that it helps guys like me uh, that return and things like that. So I'm excited. Have you seen what that looks like, the, the new return rules? Have you seen the examples of that out there? Yeah, so I, I was uh, I was looking at it a little bit. I'm going to have to study a little bit more. But, yeah, um, they got to kick it in bounds. Um, they're uh, starting five yards apart mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the 10-yard the drop. Um, uh, if they kick it out of bounds or in the end zone, he started on the 35. Uh, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot. I don't have to study a little bit more. So yeah. there there's a short ramp up for the guys to run. So I guess there's not the the all the way down the field full speed running. I mean you have to yeah. be kind of a madman to want to return you know anyways because it's such just a, a crazy position to to be in. But uh, does that give you better peace of mind? Are they trying to make it safer? Does that make you feel good as a return guy? Uh yeah absolutely because you know re returning is not easy. Not everybody can do it. Um, and uh, kickoff, especially, you know, there's a there's a lot of guys that get that full speed run, and they, they cra I call them crashed out. So, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, really just making the game more entertaining for the fans, I believe, and uh, and giving guys like me more opportunities to uh, to play the game. So, I don't know of any college in America that produces wide receivers or defensive backs and return specialists. The history of Kansas State. Absolutely. How much did that play a role in what you wanted to do and why K State? Um, it's actually funny you say that because uh, when I went to K State, I. I uh, I didn't know too much about K State. Um, uh, I was uh, I didn't really play special teams in high school like that. And then when I got there, they they from day one we special teams you, and so I adopted that uh, ideology they had, and uh, just you could just see it in the games. Like we're returning kicks, uh, multiple kicks a year consistently, uh, consecutive years, uh, multiple returners scoring, and. Uh, it's really dynamic, like the ability to get that third phase uh, to affect the game like that. So, um, you know, I, once I adopted that process, you know, I, I went all in for it and, and worked on the craft and, and studied with the guys and, and made me appreciate specialists a lot more. So uh, it, was a, it was a blessing. So Chris Kleiman, we've had him on the show a few times. He is he's a very interesting guy to me. He has a nice duality where I, I can tell he's probably a hard ass on you, but also he has a very compassionate side to him. What's it like playing for him? Um, he's he's a 100% players coach. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he he wants he wants to know what we think, uh, what works best for us, uh, what we see uh, during practice, the games, film. Um, he's he's very interactive, and but he does have a seriousness where you know he's he's getting business done so um uh I, I love coach climbing you know he gave me opportunity i was a i was a walk-on at kansas state and they uh they gave me a scholarship and uh i'm very appreciative for that um but yeah yeah i, I love coach climbing he's, he's a great guy um players coach and uh you know you don't you don't see that often especially with the uh, i was the last uh group with snyder so it was uh -huh. a, it was definitely a a big change as far as the coaching styles for me. Uh, what do you think that the future holds for Avery Johnson? You get to see him up close and personal. I mean, you know, play with Will Howard a lot, but there's a lot of buzz about this young man. Um, and we got to see him last year and, and how dynamic he can be. I mean, how good can he be? What have you seen and, and what do you expect from him? Yeah, well, what I've noticed with Avery, man, he uh, he has potential out the roof. So uh, he he got to keep working on the game, but – as you can see, he, he running, he's very dynamic, um, uh, throwing. He uh, he's connecting with the guys that are there, and uh, it's going to be dangerous. Uh, we need to be on the lookout for him, you know. And he's not afraid of of the star the star status that he has. He he's uh, he's very confident in his ability, and you know he's going he's going to create some damage this next year and these following years. So and he's just. He was just a true freshman, so mm -hmm. it's only the beginning. So I mentioned Will. Uh, what do you think about Ohio State and the opportunity that he has there? I know you probably – K-State would love to see him finish at K-State, but it just is what it is in this landscape nowadays. Uh, what do you think of the opportunity with the Buckeyes for Will Howard? Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. You know, um, uh, Ohio State has a lot of talent, and, uh, you know, he can, he can really, you know, share the ball. That's his game, sharing the ball. And I feel like, you know – yeah, it was a with Avery Johnson being at uh, Kansas State, he uh, kind of conflicted like his playing and things like that. So I think he's doing what's best for him as far as trying to make it to the next level. And uh, I'm excited for him. I'm, I'm excited to see how they how they do this year. And uh, I'll be watching it. I still talk to Will. He's he's my guy. So. We're back in Frisco, thanks to uh, the guests that we've had on today. We appreciate the Big 12, by the way. They have set us up with this great location overlooking the field as the Pro Day uh, drills have been going on. And we're uh, Brett Yormark, Big 12 commissioner, is on his way uh, to be here and sit down with us, and you can hear from him. And we'll ask him the questions we hope that you want us to ask and also the ones that we've wanted to ask, too. Uh, TJ Tampa from Iowa State, tremendous player. Stop by. We have his number. We'll call him 
a little bit later on to get him on the show today to discuss the uh, experiences. We were we were asking him about Iowa State had a really nice run last year, turned their season around after a disappointing year, and like half a dozen people, that's that's about all they lose, and loaded up with everybody that helped them get to that uh, opportunity where they were last year. <laughs> helped uh, uh, Iowa State get back to a bowl game uh, last year. So uh, we'll, we'll try to get uh, TJ on even before or after we get the commissioner to join us here in, in just a moment. Uh, Craig, the, uh, the interviews of all of what we've had, the, the ones, uh, uh, Isaac Rex is going to be my favorite because he promoted our show. That's great. But anyone in particular that stands out to you, that, that, that anything that was said that you liked the most? Uh, I don't know. I don't think anything off the top of my head. Uh, we just kind of rolled through about four or five of them earlier today, uh, one after the other. And, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just enjoyed talking to the guy. I mean, Jared Wiley, I guess, saying that uh, he didn't feel like TCU last year was oh yeah not that up to was yeah. because of a lack of talent that it was just more or less that he uh didn't do a good a good enough job leading or uh he and other senior leaders didn't do a good enough job leading and it wasn't a matter of the talent or that they had lost a bunch of guys to the pros i disagree i think a lot of it did have to do with some of the talent but he pointed to the leadership more than the talent as being the issue so um yeah that was just interesting to hear that perspective and uh, obviously, that was a tough season after the greatest season that uh, you could possibly experience outside of that Georgia game uh, and the finale there um, in, in the Natty. But, uh, yeah, that, that was just a, a cool thing to hear from him, and that's why some teams will love him whenever the time comes to call his name. I, I loved what he said. Uh, the, that Yeah, the, the lack of leadership is, is what he said, and he was one of the seniors last year uh, that was a part of the TCU team that, that imploded and did not – perform as well uh, as they had done the year before when they were on the they played for the national championship and we're now joined by big 12 commissioner brett yormark uh here at big 12 pro days in frisco texas man this has been thank you for hey being guys here. how are you how are you great doing? good to see you good to see you good to see you this has been from every player we've spoken to they have been thrilled with the experience the amenities the setup and what they're able to do. You know, on my way over here today, I was just talking about how this is just a world-class place. Um, and I'm, 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 listen, it's, it's all about the student athletes and we wanted this to be a wonderful experience for them. Uh, this was something that I had thought about even before I took the job. As we were, I was kind of going through different innovative ideas that I wanted to present during my interview process, believe it or not. And I don't know what was the impetus for me to say, hey, can we ever do some kind of centralized combine just for our conference to elevate our, our football brand and, and franchise? And when I finally took the job, I reached out to some of my friends over at the NFL and I said, hey, what, what do you think? And they said, Brett, it's not really been done that way before, but let's explore it. And a year and a half later, here we are. And uh, to see it come to life, to see NFL Network here, to see the enthusiasm from the student athletes that are all here. I mean, it, it's, it's great. And uh, obviously there's things we're going to look to do differently next year as we build this. But uh, we, we think we're onto something pretty special. And uh, I thank you guys for being here. Oh, oh it's great to be here. <laughs> no, I thank you. Your staff set us up wonderfully. It's been a great day. Now, uh, the other thing, I'm sure the scouts love you to death now because they don't have to go uh, to, you know, 12 different places or next year, 16 different places. Yeah, listen, I'm sure yeah. that those scouts that enjoy those boondoggles. Can yeah. them, <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to be frank with you. But I think overall, mm -hmm. to do it in one location um, and to have them all converge here in, in Frisco um, and give them the best that we have to offer, you know, from a Big 12 conference perspective, it's very efficient. Um, so, and listen, change isn't easy for everyone. So I'm sure there's those that are, we're kind of questioning why we are doing what we're doing, but I think overall it's been a wonderful experience and, uh, we're looking forward to really building on this for the future. So another decision that's been made as far as events like this, uh, media days going to Las Vegas later on this summer, which obviously you're adding some schools out West. Uh, there's 
the ever-evolving landscape, so to speak. So it's another summer of, of new schools coming in. But can you take us to the background of that decision? Why Vegas? Why does that make sense? And uh, and not, you know, Arlington like it has been the last few years. So we love Arlington. We love AT&T Stadium. And, I, you know, I'm obviously still a rookie commissioner. I call myself still, <laughs> still the newbie. But what I learned even last year is that there's a very special dynamic where they where the student-athletes start at at t and then they, they aspire to return there in that championship game. Unfortunately, given the World Cup uh, and there some exhibition matches they have this upcoming summer and then some renovations they have uh, in the summer thereafter, um, we're being somewhat displaced. Not because we can't come here to Frisco and because this could be an, a, a good option, but unfortunately what we've become accustomed to at at t isn't available to us, which is all good. We love at t We love the Dallas Cowboys. They've been great partners. So it's given us an opportunity to say, okay, now that we have expanded our footprint, are there other places we can take, you know, media day to, which is one of our tentpole events. And the Four Corners suggested Vegas. And Vegas to me, uh, is is a market of importance. Um, it's the entertainment capital of the world now. You guys know how I think about entertainment in yep. media. Um, so I think it's a, a natural fit for us, given where we're taking the conference and the brand. So doing it there next summer uh, at Allegiant, you know, gives us a, a, a big stage. Um, and it's, you know, closer to the footprint that we're getting into with the Four Corner School. So we're excited about it. And once we're done with Pro Day, we're going to focus on Media Day and start thinking about how do we make that really special for all involved. So I'm really excited about it. And we'll see how long we stay there. It might be just one and done. Maybe we'll do it for more than one year. And, you know, L.A. is always an option. And candidly, this wonderful facility is an option. They did it here one year. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, they, they, did. they did it one year. Yeah. And I, how I, was it? It was I, great. I, I, was it good? I, you know, yeah. it's, it's cozy, and yet it has everything you need. Yeah, no, I mean, the setup here is fantastic. You know, how it's interconnected to the hotel, and you've got retail and the outdoor spaces. And a lot of that wasn't here. That wasn't here. Oh, was that not here? It was still kind of just this. It was just this. Yeah. Just this. (laughs) So, I mean, I, I... I think it's kind of built for us. And, and a Chipotle. Respects. There was a Chipotle. Oh, so. was there? <laughs> okay. They got more than that now. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly explore this as an option moving forward. But I'm excited about Vegas. How about you guys? You excited oh, we were about there going for the Super Bowl. We, yeah. We, 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 I, yeah, I was there in great market. And, mm-hmm. I mean, boy, it, it's not only the entertainment capital of the world, it's the event capital of the world. Absolutely. And I look at this as a big event, so it's a natural fit for us. Isn't that also a lot of what you had – on the, your plate, the entertainment part of it, as you mentioned, but and, and not just doing the same thing over and over again because everyone's always done the yeah, same thing over and over. Yeah, hundred percent. And we we got to do things that are different, and we got to disrupt in a positive way. And you know, I, I'm just fortunate to work with great ads and a board that's uh, affording me the opportunity to be me, and for us to kind of broaden our horizons a little bit. And a couple of years ago, I'm not even sure the Big Twelve would have even contemplated going to Vegas. But now I think it's a very natural transition for us, given the fact that we can't beat AT&T. So we're excited about it, you know, and we'll, we'll start working on that here in the next couple of weeks. And then what happens after that, who knows? But uh, I, I think being uh, on the West Coast and accommodating the four corner schools is a good thing. You um, have made it a mission to move it around. I mean, look, you're going to play basketball games in, in Central and South America. You're going to move it around. You've done basketball events in New York. Uh, there's so many things moving around. How much does that, uh, even without you, you knowing initially, just the fact that you can be in New York, you can be in L.A., you can be in Vegas, in places where people don't regularly think about the Big 12 and then see it, and then it's just kind of implanted there almost. I think it's a great thing for us. I mean, to the extent that we can – continue to nationalize the conference and get on the consciousness of student athletes um, all over the country, I think is critically important. The best way to do that is for them to interface uh, with our brand and and what we do. So when we can play basketball in New York or, or go to Vegas or thinking about an event maybe one day in L.A., I think that's all good. So, got to the games. Uh, March Madness starting back up tonight. A couple teams remaining with Iowa State and Houston. Just how do you feel? Obviously, you'd want more. You'd love to have more teams still alive in the Sweet 16. But a uh, couple of representatives, how do you feel about uh, just I feel good about it. I mean, listen, I, I would have liked a couple more. I'm sure all of our fans would have. But, 
you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's been a great season for the Big 12. But Houston's here in, in Dallas, and we'll be rooting them on. I'll, I'll go to that game tomorrow night. Tonight, you know, Iowa State versus Illinois. Um, I think they'll fare well. Uh, I think that's a good matchup for Iowa State. And then if Iowa State wins and, and UConn wins, I mean, then the two of them face off Saturday in, in Boston. And obviously with Houston against Duke, I, I think they'll do well there too. And then they'll play the winner, I guess, of uh, Marquette and North Carolina State. So I feel really good about the next couple of days. And listen, I'd love to get two in the Final Four. And if we have at least one, I'll be satisfied. Brett, so many things have changed even since you took over with the college football playoff, the expansion. How much the revenue split with the SEC and the Big Ten, the ACC and the Big 12, there's a difference there. And I mean, Big 12 fourth. Is that a kick in the gut for you when, when those numbers came out? And was there ever a chance that anyone was going to let the SEC and the Big Ten have an automatic first round buy? Because that was floated out there as a possibility. Can you kind of give us your point of view on that and the conferences? Well, listen, I think from a conference perspective, we land in the best place possible. Um, you know, there were some guiding principles um, that the revenue uh, formula ultimately was based on. It was based on historical performance, uh, participation in the CFP, and obviously we had to extrapolate Texas and Oklahoma. It was ratings, um, and then it was uh, our multimedia rights value. Um, when you think about ratings and you take out Oklahoma and Texas, you know, we, we need to get better. Yep. And when you think about participation, uh, we had one school, TCU, in 10 years. Um, so I think we landed the best place possible. And we grinded. Trust me. We worked hard at it. And... Um, I think the ACC is about 2.49% higher than us, and that's relatively de minimis in the scheme of things. Um, so I think we land in a pretty good place. And, you know, the way I look at it is we, we're all at the same table still, which is a good thing. We all might like look a little different, but we're all at the same table. No one's at the kids' table. And one of the things that I fought for was, you know, the reset. Uh, that look in provision in 2028. Um, obviously, if there's material realignment, it could be triggered in advance. But there's a look in in 2028. So I think at the end of the day, no different than what I've said from day one since I took the job, I'm betting on the Big 12. I'm betting on our future. I'm betting on our growth. I know we're going to get better across the board. I know we got better in football with the four corners. I know the investment our schools are making in football. We're going to continue to get better at basketball. And I think Olympic sports also has real upside for us, and women's sports uh, specifically. So um, I'm excited about where we're going. Um, I think long term we'll, we'll be just fine when it comes to the CFP. Um, we, we do have um, an automatic um, bid, if you will, when you think about the conference champion, and we were able to protect that, which I think is critically important moving forward. And um, I know our schools are excited to invest and get better and to take some of those at large also. Do Tony Petiti and Greg Sankey truly care about the Big 12 and the ecosystem of college athletics? They say they do, do they? Listen, I think at the end of the day, um, we, all, we, we all want what's right for the institution. But in many cases, our focus is on what's best for our conferences. Sure. And uh, I'm going to continue to fight for this conference for all the right reasons because I believe in it. I'm passionate about it. I love where we're going. I, I'm bullish on our future. And I'm sure Greg and, and Tony feel the same way about their conferences. And that's okay. I love competition. I'm not conceding anything when it comes to football. Um, uh, I know we're going to get better. And um, I'm excited about where we are and, and you know, I'm... I'm looking forward to what unfolds over the course of the next couple of years. When it comes to the talk around expanding the NCAA basketball tournament, I think if you surveyed fans, they would say don't do anything to it. Um, the It seems like there's kind of like when you, you have that talk about that, most fans wouldn't want that. They wanted the football playoffs expanded, obviously. Basketball not. Wouldn't it be better to focus on the regular season than kind of 
tweaking with something that's really awesome the way it is. Listen, I've been a fan of March Madness uh, for many, many years. I, I'm not sure there's a better event in sports. It, it really captures the imagination of so many. Um, whether it's casual fans or hardcore fans, you saw some of the numbers, uh, the ratings after the first weekend. I mean, both men's and women's are, are going up. It's fantastic. And the engagement has been off the charts. Um, I know there's been rumors about modest expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it, if the fans want it and it doesn't compromise the integrity uh, of the tournament, you know, I'm in favor of it. The numbers do show that if we do expand, you know, the, the Power Four conferences will benefit mostly for, you know, from that type of expansion. Um, and I think if we do move in that direction, there needs to be a thoughtful process in, in how we think about it um, and, and what it means. Um, but uh, I'm open to the conversation. And, and I've had conversations with my fellow uh, Power Four commissioners as well as Charlie Baker. So we'll see what happens. Let me ask you this. If that happens... And if that is ever, a, and that's a separate to, um, revenue flow, wouldn't the Big 12 then be able to say, hey, we've had Kansas win it, we've had Baylor win it, we've had others win it, and the SEC or the Big 10, it's been a while. Do you all get the same clout as they're getting in football? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and, and people might not like hearing this, but if unequal revenue distribution works for football, that it needs to be applied to other areas of the system, okay? And, you know, the value of Kansas, the value of Houston and some of the bigger brands, Baylor, um, they should be rewarded for what they bring to the table. And I'm very bullish on what the Big 12 brings to that tournament and the value we bring. And when we think about potential changes down the road, if and when there are any, I think you need to look at it very holistically. Yep. You can't just look at how many numbers uh, are increased or not. You need to look at the whole thing, and uh, revenue is a part of it. Um, and if you create value, you should receive value. Um, and candidly, that was the position that the SEC and the Big Ten took with the CFP. We're creating the value. We should be rewarded. And you know what? I was okay with it. They did create value. I mean, the SEC put 40% of the participants in the CFP uh, over the last 10 years. Okay, so I look at it from a basketball perspective. That's a real strength of ours right now. And uh, if we're going to look at the, the tournament uh, and when we do, I want to look at it from a holistic point of view. And look, if Arizona wins this year, then because you had to extrapolate Texas and Oklahoma, you get to claim that one. Well, I mean, listen, when you think about uh, the value that, you know, Arizona brings and other schools, you know, for, of some of the four corners. Um, as good as we are in basketball today, we get that much better. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, we'll see what, it, what happens in the future. But, again, if it, if it worked for the CFP, we need to take that model elsewhere. You mentioned earlier that, that you fought when doing the CFP negotiations and that it wasn't just like, hey, you know, we're just whatever y'all want. But there is a perception that's grown because of the SEC and the Big Ten's just stranglehold of power, it seems like, of basically you're going to do what we want or we're going to take our ball and we're going to go. Is that a misperception? And, and I guess how would you describe your um, stance or um, the ACC stance or others that aren't those two when it comes to do you guys feel like you have actual say at the table or is it basically an ultimatum? They get what they want or they – Pack their no, listen, and I would say that we, we have a definite seat at the table, I'm a, um, and I have a pretty vocal seat at the table. Uh, I think you guys have gotten to know me. I'm not mm -hmm. one that just uh, takes it all in and, and doesn't, you know, put a little out. Um, if I disagree, <laughs> I'm going to tell someone I disagree. And, and if I have a conviction for a, a point of view, I'm going to let them know my conviction. And uh, I think both myself and Jim Phillips uh, made that very clear. Uh, ultimately, we landed where we landed, but um, we spent a lot of time together uh, discussing the different iterations, and we landed where we landed. Um, but when there was disagreement in the room, um, you know, all parties were aware of it. What are you like when you um, – it's not that if you don't get your way, but if you feel strongly enough about something, no matter what it is, what are you like if you start wondering if they're listening to you? 
Well, listen, I often – sometimes <laughs> sometimes we can end up saying we'll agree to disagree. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, I don't get overly emotional about it, but I do have great conviction, and I'm very passionate about what I believe in. And uh, hopefully, you know, more times than not, I can be very convincing. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think I look at things in a, in a fair way and in the right perspective. If you don't get Texas and Oklahoma to count for you, did you get a little bit of a nugget with Cincinnati? I did not. And, 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 and the SEC didn't I've, get – I've been wanting to know. Yeah, and the SEC didn't get Texas and Oklahoma. Okay. Oh, okay. You okay. Know, so I want Fair you to know that – Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, no, they, didn't, they didn't get that either. Was, okay. it, was um, it like you just kind of like cancel each other out in that kind yeah, of regard? That, in, in, yeah, in that respect it is. I mean, yeah. and, and when you look at it – and. And it's, it's all good at the end of the day. We were the only conference that lost anyone. You know, when you think about it in the last 10 years. The ACC didn't lose anyone. The SEC didn't lose anyone. The Big Ten didn't lose anyone. The Big 12 did. Um, now, many gained, mm-hmm. but we didn't take that into the formula. It was really about historical performance, and if someone left, you, you can't count on that on the go forward. But that's okay. You know, we, we did what we needed to do, but in that next iteration, it'll be different. So um, the next step in college football, that you hear about the possibility of a separation. You're at the table. You're eating the prime rib or whatever it is with everyone else. It just depends on what you want to put on it, what the side dishes are. Is that even something you think about much about the possibility there could be the haves and the haves not? And what does Brett Yormark think about that? I don't. I don't think about that. I don't think anyone's okay. breaking away. I mean, I think we're all in this together. We, we, you know, we're we're obviously very competitive. Um, uh, everyone's narrative is a bit different, um, but as I've often said, I'm bullish on our future. I'm bullish on where we're going. Uh, you know, I look at our conference in many respects as a mature startup. Um, we we're not a legacy conference versus some of the older conferences, and uh, I'm 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 treating it as such. And we have a lot of growth ahead of us. And it's up to me as the commissioner to help to optimize that growth and capture that growth, which we're going to do. And the first step was expansion. And we'll be a first, for the first time ever, a 16-team um, uh, you know, conference. And, and I love where we're going. I love the makeup of this conference. Um, I'm betting on each and every one of our schools uh, as they are betting on themselves. And... Um, I'm excited for our future, and I really don't focus on who's breaking way or not. You know, at the end of the day, and I've said this really since I took the job, my goal is, to, is for the Big 12 to be the best version of themselves. And if we're the best version of the Big 12 that we can be, we're going to be just fine. So you've got so many topics on your plate. I don't know how much you dabble in. For example, the conversation about revenue sharing um, with athletes getting paid directly through schools, and that just seems to be something that's just around the corner. And, and how much are those, do you get into those types of conversations? Because I don't know how much that affects you at a conference commissioner level. It seems like more of an individual school thing, but can you take us well, into no, your perspective? Listen, we, we have strategy sessions with all of our uh, member institutions. We talk about the future, what the model might look like. Obviously, it's – in the D1 ticker and everywhere else every day. Yeah. Um, I do think the model's going to change. Uh, I think many have said that before. I do think we are, we're moving towards a revenue share model. What that looks like specifically, I can't tell you today. Um, but hopefully we're going to get closer um, to a model that's sustainable uh, and one that we can all sign up for. Uh, and I know uh, I'm, I'm working very closely with my fellow Power 4 commissioners on what that model should look like. And how do we get there? Um, and um, it's something that we're focused on. And, and, and on a personal level, I'm focused on it more now than I've ever been. Is there a way to get there without having Congress do anything? Can you bypass them and their gridlock? I, I think ultimately we're going to need Congress to help us. I, I think having spent some time on the Hill, I'm not sure Congress wants to save us, um, but I think they have an appetite to help us, and there's a distinct difference. And, but we have to help ourselves, and we've got to take that first step and then ultimately go to, go to Congress to codify certain things. And, and uh, as we think about the sequencing of you know, where we need to go and how we get there, I think that's the sequence. Is it fair to say you already have four or five ideas that you, we just have? We don't know what they are yet? <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I've told my, my team, I got a whiteboard in my office, 
In fact, I take a picture of that whiteboard every couple, every couple of days because I make some changes to it and I carry it on my iPhone. And uh, I'm trying not to introduce any new ideas right now because we are in execution mode, full execution mm -hmm. mode. Um, you know, when you think about the next five or six months, you know, we're bringing four new schools in. We're introducing two, two new sports. We're now up to 25 sports in the conference. We're bringing in women's lacrosse and beach volleyball. We launched our PSL around Kansas City. Um, we're looking at, a, a, at doing a, a championship for volleyball for the first time and introducing that in 25. Um, we are moving our, our offices in October uh, from where our current office is today. We've got a lot on our plate. And it, it, you're staying in Dallas for No, work? we're in Las Colinas. It was, oh, yeah. It's okay. public. Yeah. But we're moving out of our, our, our current home. We've been there for about 28 years yeah. into a more contemporary office space. We've grown quite a bit. You know, since I've been on board, we've doubled the size of the conference. Um, so there's a lot on our plate right now. Uh, obviously, Media Day in, La in Las Vegas is new and different. You know, historically, we've been right here in Dallas. So a lot on our plate. So execution is key for me. We want to execute at a high level. Um, so I'm not. I'm looking not to burden our 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 staff with too much on their plate. But where I see opportunity, and I see opportunity where we can really seize the moment. You know, we're we're going to do what we need to do. So yeah. if anybody asks to learn on a new, new idea, they've got to move. Moving's yeah, a pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you've done it a lot. No, I have. I have. You're absolutely right. My wife just moved to Dallas. <laughs> well, that's that's been what a year and a half or so. No, so I've been here for. Um, It'll be two years in August. She just moved here uh, two months ago. Wow! To join me, which is nice. Um, she was transitioning out of her restaurant. Her sister's now running it, and her sister's kids. So having her here has been great. Um, in fact, she has uh, made the trips to Baylor quite a bit with me of late. Yeah, you've been there a lot. I was a lot there this year because what I did with my travel, is, you know, for basketball is. I was using TCU and, ba and Baylor as my home base because it wasn't so much about being on campuses as much as it was saying hello to the coaches and engaging with the officials and, and the team. So um, it's a quick drive for me, which worked out really well. So I enjoyed being on campus, obviously love the new building and, and everything they're doing there. So it worked out well. I, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you about a basketball question. When a coach is uh, reprimanded, fined, whatever, it's public, why aren't officials – if they're reprimanded or maybe asked not to maybe officiate for a week or two? So, you know, that's a great question. And it's a question that I posed to my ADs about transparency. And we had a big meeting in Kansas City about it. And, you know, I came from the NBA, as you know, and the NBA often um, in the last two minutes, uh, I think of a game, they will go back, and if there were mistakes made, they'll publicly say there were some missed calls or incorrect calls. Mm -hmm. They don't call out any officials in particular, but they'll say it was an incorrect call. And the question is, should we be doing the same? Because I'm all about accountability, and I'm all about transparency to the fans. And it's something that we are discussing Good. Um, as, we, as we look towards next year. Is that a, a new dynamic and something that we should introduce? And it's all about transparency and accountability. Would you be in favor of officiating be centralized among all the conferences instead of having Big 12 officials, ACC officials, SEC officials? Or is that not something you guys can, well, can do? We have our primary officials. Mm -hmm. We've got about 55 uh, officials in our consortium, and, and, and many of them are primary but they still do games in other conferences. Um, and, and that's the whole system. So that's not unique to the Big 12. Um, so, and they're independent contractors, unlike yeah. the NBA when, when they're employees. So it's a different dynamic. So I like the arrangement right now. Uh, the question is, do we maybe expand our consortium? Do we get a, better, uh, a, a bigger pipeline of officials? Um, which obviously I think is critical on a go forward basis. Um, all those things we're thinking about now, you know, because after every season, we'll go through an audit. We'll look at what worked well, what didn't, and how do we improve for the next year? And we're going through that exercise right now. Uh, I know you got to go, and we appreciate your time today. And this again, why, uh, again, there's more time to come because Saturday the, the event yeah. comes back. Can you 
Do you feel like the conference is now more, you use that word efficient. Can, is that one of the words you want to use across the board? You want it to be not only the brand gets better, everybody gets better, but becomes more efficient across the board? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I think, again, I'll, I'll go back to this. You know, we're, we're, we've been a bit of a mature startup. You know, that's kind of how I thought about it when I took over. Um, we, we needed to add resources and human capital we needed to redefine people's roles so we could be more efficient and we can execute at a higher level. And I think you're seeing that now. I mean, in all due respect to the former Big 12, if you will, because I think we're the new Big 12 now, two years ago they could never have pulled off a, a, a pro day like this. Our staff has done an incredible job, led by Scott Draper, who's yep. our vice president. Glad football. you mentioned him, yeah. We, we did not have the resources. Um, to do something like this. We didn't have a marketing team to promote it, to engage on social media, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, I think efficient is, is a good word to use. We're becoming more efficient. Uh, we're becoming more capable um, as, as a business, as an operation. And, and uh, again, I, I think the best is, you know, right in front of us. I mean, I'm a wrestling job. fan, so I want to ask you, WWE is as hot as it's ever been. You guys partnered with them. People are like, what in the world? College, athletics, WWE, Undertaker's there giving Quinn Ewers a belt at the <laughs> football game and at the basketball tournament. Uh, what has that partnership been like from, from your Fantastic. perspective? Yeah. You know, it's enabled us to tap into a different fan base. Uh, you go back to the football champ game, which was our first formal uh, engagement with WWE. I mean, they were branded alongside us uh, throughout, you know, Champ Weekend, and obviously the belt was a big hit. We had WWE stars, and our fans really rallied around them, and um, so we're excited, and we're looking to continue to extend that relationship. We took it to us to Kansas City, where the MVPs of both the women's and men's received a belt, uh, which they loved. And um, we're going to try to continue that trend through all of our championships and see where there's really points of connectivity. In fact, some of the WWE stars are coming uh, this weekend during Pro Day um, to meet with you know, many of the student athletes because some of them aren't going to make it in right. the NFL. And, and that's okay mm -hmm. because we're trying to provide other opportunities. You have the United Football League that's here and their scouts. You have the CFL that's here, You've, the WWE's here. Um, many former football players have become wrestlers. Uh, in fact, Michael Jordan's NASCAR racing team will also be here this week because if you look at pit crews, many of them are made up of former football players. So yes, this is a combine, it's a pro day, it's in partnership with the NFL, but we want to explore every and all opportunity um, to give you know, our student athletes that next chapter and maybe it's in the NFL, hopefully it is, but if it's not, can we, can we do other things for them? Um, so th this whole pro day, the concept here is to go as deep as we can, and then there's life skills exercises. In fact, tonight I'll be on a panel just addressing, you know, to some of the student athletes a little bit about my journey and, 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 and how I got to where I am today, and I know others are gonna be doing the same, so we can listen and learn from each other. So. Um, just excited about the depth of what we're doing here and how we're able to personalize it uh, a little bit more than maybe what they do at, even at the NFL Combine. Um, so, um, and again, we'll, we'll build on this for next year. So this is just the start. With all that you have on your plate, are you at least keeping an eye on what's happening with the ACC? Because that could be like another dam breaking. Listen, I, I don't know what what's going to happen with realignment moving forward. No one has a crystal ball, but I just think, you know, from where I sit, um, I, I've just got to be aware of what's going on all the time. Um, and I've always done that. I mean, I, I consider myself someone that's pretty well read and pretty well connected um, because I'm not one that likes to be surprised. And, you know, no different than what we did with the four corners. If there's ever an opportunity to seize the moment, you want to seize the moment and you want to take advantage of it. And um, so, you know, I, I live my life that way, you know, regardless of what it is. Wait, uh, thank you. A uh, lot of time with us today. We met you for the first time when you're, you're at the Big 12 Commissioner when we were at Big 12 Media Days. He was in Hawaii getting married, so he was kind of busy, but uh, always appreciate your no, time. No, thank you guys. Really I do. appreciate your support of what we do and 
thank you for you know being here, and I look forward to chatting again soon. It's been a great day for us. We've had players on. Ren Baker was on. Uh, we'll tell Mac Roach you said hi. Tell as, Mac. As if you guys don't that, text every Mac night. Mac is the, my guy. We text every other day, and um, I know he's doing well, and Ren just got himself a great coach. He did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I saw that today, I guess, his the coach's yeah. son. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, he, he, happened, he, he happened yeah. to follow him in the transfer. <laughs> yeah. That, hey, that's. He's a great recruiter. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I guess you know the, the kid's a hell of a player, right? Yeah. He oh, is, oh no. Yeah, he's really good. Oh, my yeah. son was texting me today. I think he was in the top five of scores mm-hmm. in college basketball this year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a big so, deal for um, for them. Yeah. 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 So yeah. You, Ren did okay. Great would, basketball. Player. I would just say you come here, you're out of the will. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'm Italian. I we we do get vindictive pretty well. Thank you, man. Man, Good. Thank you, time. guys. Appreciate you. Be well. Brett right. Yolmark, Big Thank 12 you. Commissioner in Frisco at Big 12 Pro Days 365 Sports. It's Dodge Power Shot Days at Allen Samuels in Waco. Experience the adrenaline-pumping performance and cutting-edge technology of Dodge. From the sleek and stylish 2023 Charger to the performance and muscle of a Challenger to the bold and rugged Durango. During Dodge Power Shot Days, we're offering amazing deals and special incentives that will make driving a new Dodge even more exhilarating. Don't miss out on these exclusive savings. Visit Allen Samuels in Waco today and unleash the power of Dodge. Come by. Let's be friends. Developed by Startup Waco, a nonprofit organization, GXG is a program designed to support the entrepreneurial development of Baylor University student athletes through NIL activations. The program helps student athletes maximize their platforms and offers a comprehensive support system for them to create and grow new businesses that not only benefit themselves, but also uplift the local economy. Fans who wish to support student athletes can donate to GXG via the GXG. GXG NIL Fund, BaylorBears.com slash GXG. Contributions to support NIL activations through GXG can be made at BaylorBears.com slash GXG. For more information, follow at GXG underscore GreenXGold on social media and visit the official website www.gxg.startupwaco.com. GXG, empowering student-athlete entrepreneurship and uplifting the local economy through NIL activations. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? By not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Are you ready to elevate your Waco experience to a whole new level? Look no further than the Baylor Club, where you can indulge in one-of-a-kind luxury and unwind in our exclusive lounge area. Located in the heart of McLean Stadium, this elite club offers five-star member atmosphere for all your work and play needs. With a master culinary team and outstanding hospitality, we take pampering to a whole new level. Weddings, milestones, businesses, and birthdays. A stadium roaring with bare spirit featuring stunning city skyline views, the Baylor Club truly has it all. The Baylor Club is the destination for Baylor basketball, pregame meals, beverages, with this special membership offer. If you mention Sikkim 365 or 365 Sports Radio, just ask for John or Devin for details. For interest in membership or your next private event, call 254-710-8080 or Google Baylor Club Linktree for more information on menus, calendars, upcoming special events. Say yes to the Baylor Club today. 254 254- 710-8080 or Google Baylor Club Linktree. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 5 o'clock hour is sponsored by Edward Jones Investments with financial advisor Brad Wilson. Investing his time and experience back to you and your money during today's changing times. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. All Big 12, all American. Beanie Bishop, West Virginia cornerback, joins us on 365 Sports. Man, what a year. Yes, sir. What a year all that meant to you. And and, and, and did, you, did it all just click? Oh, you've been good, but did it all just kind of click together? Why did you take it to the next level? Um, it was just one of those things. Uh, 
I was I had a year at Minnesota where, you know, I wasn't as productive and didn't get to play as much as I wanted to. So, you know, I kind of had a, a lot of built up, you know, um, and things that I learned that I wasn't able to use, you know, playing at Minnesota. So, you know, I took all of those things that I learned at Minnesota and from uh, Western Kentucky and preparing and things like that and using the resources that we have at West Virginia and, you know, trusting the coaches and the coaches trusted me and, and they let me be myself. So that's like one of the biggest things I was able to be myself and be free. And, and that led to a lot of production. When we were at big 12 media days, coach Brown, I mean, there's no other word. He was pissed because they got the colors wrong on his backdrop. They picked you guys last. I say they. I mean, we as the media yeah, picked you guys I last. I didn't do that. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> picked you guys last. And he was – he had a chip on his shoulder about it. Did that – I mean, that clearly carried over to you guys because you came out this year on a mission to show that you weren't what everybody thought you were. When did you feel that kind of start to carry over, that he was on a mission to prove uh, everybody wrong about you guys? Um, I think like as soon as the, the rankings came out, you know, uh, we was watching it, uh, as a team, uh, in the dining hall and we seen that and we was like, you know, we was taken back by that, um, and we felt we was disrespected. Um, and a lot of guys on the team, uh, kind of overlooked myself. I would say for, for sure myself, I felt that I was overlooked, you know, coming out of high school and, and I always had that chip on my shoulder. So that just added a little extra motivation and, you know, just seeing the coach pissed off made us more pissed off, you know, and, you know, wanted to, you know, prove everybody wrong. What was that like to get yourself into a bowl game, go in a bowl game, end on a hot note like that? Just um, how would you describe last season? How how fun was it? And what was it like being with your teammates? All that good stuff. Uh, it was it was great. You know, I was around guys that I enjoyed uh, having their company and things like that. And we all worked together, you know, party together and do things like that, go out, play bowling and you know, all of those kind of things. And it was it was just exciting, um, you know, seeing guys like we we did everything together. Um, it was like a real, like real, real brotherhood. So, you know, being able to go out and get wins, grind wins out at, at TCU, at Baylor, you know, things like that. And, you know, having those guys that you can trust and, you know, even guys, you know, ha being, the wet, being in each other's weddings, you know, pretty soon and things like that. And, you know, it's just something that you really can't describe. I thought that you mentioned Baylor. We're at that game, covering that game. I mean, they came back and they took the lead, and yet you guys didn't blink. Garrett Green and company went right back down the field. Was that kind of that just kind of a great way to end it all as far as the season itself, the regular season? Um, yes, sir. As far as the ending of the game goes, so not the special team so much. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rich, Rich and Reese took it to the house twice. twice. Yeah, yeah, back to back. Uh, I don't think the offense touched the field to almost the second quarter. So, yeah. you know, um, but, that, yeah, it was pretty pretty exciting, especially to um, – Went on a Hail Mary after losing to Houston on a Hail Mary. I know guys are probably going to be pissed that I said bring it up and, um, yeah. you know, had it, Houston guys bring it up to us. So, you know, <laughs> I think it was a, a great way to, to show resiliency, um, especially, you know, like I said, losing that Houston game the way we did. And for us to finish the season um, out, you know, on a winning on the kind of like the Hail Mary last play type of deal, it was it was huge. Who would uh, you? Because you've had to practice against them both. Now you don't get to hit Garrett Green in practice uh, because he's the quarterback. But I'm sure you've taken a lick or two from C.J. Donaldson. So if you had to pick, trying to bring down the freight train that is C.J. Donaldson, or trying to uh, break down and make sure you get a hold of Garrett Green and he's so rascally. Who I got to pick? Yeah, you got to pick. I want to. I want to. You know. Well, this is look so. I'm a DB. I want to get the running back first. Yeah. But, you know, it's always good to – but that's my guy, obviously. But it's always yeah. good to – whenever you can, put a good lick on the quarterback. Yeah. So, you know, they don't let you He's touch the quarterback. He's a physical dude, too, though. Yeah, he, he is. is. Yeah. He, yeah, he'll drop the shoulder on guys, and, and, and he had me worried a few games and where I was like, man, you need to slide. But, you know, he uses his legs a lot, and he's a great guy, and so is CJ. So, being – you didn't go to the NFL Combine, right? No, sir. Right. You got snubbed there. Um what kind of a motivation was that? And then to come out here today, what were you looking to prove? I know you had the fastest 40, 4, 3, 9. So I guess kind of a two-part. How how much did that motivate you? Um, and how much do you feel like you were able to put out some good stuff today? Um, you know, I just added that to to the list. Um, not getting a combat, combat invite, you know, it's another one of those things where, you know, I was overlooked, especially uh, how much production I had, the accolades that I racked up and, and things like that. Um, so you know, I kind of, I kind of grew to, 
to you know feel feel kind of numb to those type of deals uh i had more guys pissed off about it than i was but you know because i always look forward to the opportunities that i have so today um i was just this was my combine so i decided that i needed to do you know everything that i that i was training to do and you know run fast uh I know I'm fast, but, you know, a lot of scouts didn't know I was fast, but just showing how efficient I am out of my breaks, um, running fast and things like that. So when I when I didn't get the combat invite, you know, I was training head down. Um, a lot of guys that I was training with, they, they left and went to the combat, and I was still working. So. so then what did this event mean to you? Because this is unique. They've never done this. No one's ever done this where everyone was combined from one conference other than Texas and OU. To have this event, when you heard about it, what did it mean to you, and how has this been for you? Um, it's it's been great, you know, especially for guys that you know wouldn't wouldn't have a lot of scouts at their schools. Um, I think that everybody gets an equal opportunity for scouts to you know uh, to look at them and things like that, and and just see okay, did we like this guy or you know or who is him, who is this guy, you know, so. I think it's a it's a very good good deal. If somebody didn't have you on at least their list, they do now. Yes, sir. If because all thirty two teams were here today. Yes, sir. All thirty two teams were represented. Beanie Bishop, cornerback, West Virginia, all American, with us on three sixty five Sports. Beanie, um, what was it? I mean, you you were at a couple other places, but when you get to West Virginia and you guys win a game and it gets rowdy in Morgantown afterwards. They're burning couches. They're doing all that. What was that experience like, you know, just seeing the unbridled joy that a football win brings to Morgantown? Um, you know, uh, with us, West, us being West Virginia, not having a pro football team or any pro sports teams, you know, uh, they shut the whole state down to, to watch us play and, you know, uh, people who drive from all over the state four or five hours and and things like that and it and it just it just means so much to the the fans the state and you know whenever we get a win and be able to sing country roads it's the best feeling oh, ever. Oh, it sounds so. Ma- <laughs> do they still burn couches? I was told that they don't do that anymore. No, nah, I don't think I've seen any burned. <laughs> <laughs> I think they kind of. I think they got past. That we had listen. We have one in our studio. We're trying to get rid of. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, and we we'll, I, like. I'll just put it out in the air we'll right now. Baker. If yeah. if West Virginia fans would like to pay for the shipping, you can burn it as soon yeah. as it gets there when mm-hmm. they when you guys win a game. So. Yeah, um, it probably uh, if they burn the couch, it'll be when they play Penn State at home. Oh, yeah. they, they win that game. Yeah, uh, yeah, they, they could know. party that night. Yeah, they could party, party hard. What's the what was the being part of the pit rivalry um, like? It was it was great. I hate those guys. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, How do you really feel? No, yeah, yeah. no hoes bars. Um, don't I don't really I don't respect those guys. I mean, I have a respect for them, but at the same time, you know, you don't. That's yes. That's, you know, so and the coach, Coach Brown, he showed us the video of them walking us off the field. Um, you know when. The year, the year before, so we watched that so many times. Watched it, watched it, watched it. You know, so I just, I kind of got that. Like, man, I hate these guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, no way they're gonna walk us off the off the field and 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 think it's okay. And 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 I'm not gonna be able to get revenge. You know, I wasn't able to help them the previous year. So, for me to be able to be in the rivalry, I wanted to do as much as I can for us to get the win and, you know, be able to sing the song. So this is your third school that you wrap up. We we we've asked this question. So you're going to be, uh, let's say it's a Super Bowl, which would be great. Yes, sir. When they introduce you, which college do you say? West Virginia. Okay. There you go. Well, we've asked that because this is something we've also come to the conclusion because the rules have changed, transfer portal, et cetera, is the average seems to be that by the end of a four- or five-year career that a lot of players may have played in two or three schools. Mm-hmm. And so I was curious, we were curious about which one you would use or would you go back to your high school Yeah. You say your high school? Yeah, I, I would say West Virginia. Um, and if it wasn't that, it would be West Kentucky. I just went to school at Minnesota. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh my God! What did, uh... it, it's we were there. We were there for the Super Bowl when it was there in February. Yeah, and I like we're from the South, so I'm not like when I'm walking around. There are times I'd be at the hotel and they'd be like, "Can I help you?" I said, "I just want to know how you live here." Yeah, like yeah. how do you do it? Yeah, like have you not like gone insane? Don't put your tongue on a railing. Like, do, do, yeah. do you understand that? Like I'm terrified to go out there, and I just have to go out. There's an Outback Steakhouse across the way. That's the only place I'm going. I'm terrified to walk 100 yeah. yards. Yeah, um, <laughs> you can't. You can't really drive out there. Um, yeah. 
you hit a pothole, you might need a new set of tires. You might need a new car. <laughs> <laughs> May, may, that you might hit a pothole so deep you are you're, you're part of that, that yeah. underground mission. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. what, gonna... what did that freedom of movement allow for you though? You think as as a player? Because um, you know there's a lot of complaints people that don't understand situations, but you might not be in this position if you hadn't have have left and, and made the decisions you did. So just how valuable was that player freedom of movement that you guys didn't have for so so long? I mean, so many decades there was not that was not allowed. How how important was that? Do you think in your career to have those options? Um, I think it was it was great. You know, because a lot of guys, well, some guys use the portal for the right way, uh, for the right reason. Um, myself, I didn't look for any in any nil opportunities. I wasn't worried about that. You know, I was more focused on. Um, getting an opportunity to, you know, have the best year that I could to potentially be, you know, in the NFL the following year. So um, I think it helped me tremendously. Uh, I was able to learn when I went to Minnesota and then use some of those things to take me on to West Virginia, which is the reason why I'm here now. Would you say, would you recommend to, to guys like, yes, look, you can talk about NIL when that comes, but find the place first because mm -hmm. – most of the time, you're going to get NIL, especially in your situation. You're talking about a year. Like, you have one year. Like, you knew that, that somebody was going to, like, uh, all you had to do was ask and find out about that. But finding your best fit before you ask about the money is probably a better thing. Yes, for sure. Because in the long term, for well, for me at least, I was thinking NFL. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about, oh, uh, this little bit amount of money, you know, because you'll make more money, you know, in the long run if you get to be able to go to the NFL um, and a lot of guys don't think about that. They think about, oh, I want to get this amount of money and go to this school, but that school doesn't do good. I'm not really playing as much. And, you know, okay, now you stuck with this 100000 um, and no opportunity to go to the next level. So it doesn't – it really doesn't equal out, you know what I'm saying? Oh, well, we the, clip that. All and, the stats yeah. that I saw from you, the one that I just saw pop up, you played at 95% of the snaps on defense. Yes, sir. So you didn't come off the field. Uh, I came off the field once. Uh, Cincinnati <laughs> player hit me in it below the belt. So. <laughs> oh, you had to get, get, get it. Catch your breath. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna show y'all. I'm gonna show y'all the clip. I got it uh, pulled up on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Do not stand by the pal. Do not stand by the pal. <laughs> well, you 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 survived it. Yes, yeah. sir. You survived it. Man, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. The Big Twelve obviously put on a hell of an event. It continues on Saturday. We've been yeah. here all morning long. We what's got one more. To yeah, what's it like just being around these other players yeah. from around the league? No, typically it's your pro day. Like, this obviously brings all the, the NFL teams together, um, whereas you might not get that at all 14 places. But what's mm -hmm. it like to just be working alongside guys from BYU and Baylor and wherever else? Um, You just get to pick guys' brains um, about the game and, you know, and see how guys work and see how guys look on a on a day-to-day -day basis kind of deal like. Um, seeing how guys go through their drill, what's their thought process through f doing the 40s, like little techniques and, and ways to get really, really get better, you know, because some of these guys are, you know, are guys that, you know, play at a really, really high level and, and, and will be able to play in the NFL uh, potentially. Uh, so just being able to understand, okay, just ways that guys break down film, you know, different things, even about outside of football, like things that they do to manage stress and, you know, relax their mind. By the way, one of our listeners, we have some West Virginia that watched this show on YouTube, and he said, tell Beanie he's a legend. Um, appreciate everything uh, that you did while you were at West Virginia. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, it was fun being a Mountaineer for the seven months that I was there, you know, and, and, it, and I always come back. It feels like home. Yeah. He said you're a Mountaineer for life. <laughs> yes, yeah. sir, for yeah. sure. That's Michael DeHart. He asked yeah. specific when I said yesterday, like, hey, we're going to get some guys, anybody you want us to look for specifically. He was the first person. He said Beanie Bishop. Yes, sir, That's what sure. he said. I, so. loved, I love those guys out there. Um, the only time that I ever get recognized in the grocery stores in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, good luck. What's next? You uh, you going to be here for the rest of the weekend, or are you going to start doing some of those visits, those 30 uh, visits, whatever? Uh, I'm going to go back to West Virginia um, and do more training and stuff like that and, you know, go to different uh, – I got something lined up with the commanders on a knife, so, you know, potentially the Steelers, you know, just, all, you know, whatever whatever comes up. All commanders fans right Washington here. Washington fans all right here, fans. all three of us. Yes, yeah. Sir.
We, we'll get we, the vote of confidence. We really we want good players to go there. They, yeah. they need good players. Yes, sir. They, they also need good players here. This yeah. is yeah. <laughs> this is this is where this is not this. Yeah, look, do you have an NFL team that's your favorite team? No, no, sir. No. Whichever team picks well, me up. Yeah, <laughs> <team. laughs> yeah. All right, man. What a fun, great personality. Appreciate getting to know you. Congratulations on the forty and for what you did last year with West Virginia. Beanie Bishop, All American cornerback on 365 Sports in Frisco. It's Dodge Power Shot Days at Allen Samuels in Waco. Experience the adrenaline-pumping performance and cutting-edge technology of Dodge. From the sleek and stylish 2023 Charger to the performance and muscle of a Challenger to the bold and rugged Durango. During Dodge Power Shot Days, we're offering amazing deals and special incentives that will make driving a new Dodge even more exhilarating. Don't miss out on these exclusive savings. Visit Allen Samuels in Waco today and unleash the power of Dodge. Come by. Let's be friends. Developed by Startup Waco, a nonprofit organization, GXG is a program designed to support the entrepreneurial development of Baylor University student athletes through NIL activations. The program helps student athletes maximize their platforms and offers a comprehensive support system for them to create and grow new businesses that not only benefit themselves, but also uplift the local economy. Fans who wish to support student athletes can donate to GXG via the GXG. GXG NIL Fund, BaylorBears.com slash GXG. Contributions to support NIL activations through GXG can be made at BaylorBears.com slash GXG. For more information, follow at GXG underscore Green X Gold on social media and visit the official website www.gxg.startupwaco.com. GXG, empowering student-athlete entrepreneurship and uplifting the local economy economy through NIL activations. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? By not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Are you ready to elevate your Waco experience to a whole new level? Look no further than the Baylor Club, where you can indulge in one-of-a-kind luxury and unwind in our exclusive lounge area. Located in the heart of McLean Stadium, this elite club offers five-star member atmosphere for all your work and play needs. With a master culinary team and outstanding hospitality, we take pampering to a whole new level. Weddings, milestones, businesses, and birthdays. A stadium roaring with bare spirit featuring stunning city skyline views, the Baylor Club truly has it all. The Baylor Club is the destination for Baylor basketball pregame meals, beverages, with this special membership offer. If you mention Sikkim 365 or 365 Sports Radio, just ask for John or Devin for details. For- it's time for Paul Catalina's Top 5, brought to you by Texas Beef House. Where's the best beef in Texas? Your house when you order from Texas Beef House. Unleash the flavor of Texas raised Wagyu. From our pasture to your plate, TexasBeefHouse.com. want to thank uh, also our new sponsor, FundedSportsTrader.com. They were the sponsor of today's event. We're going to be doing more stuff with them down the line. Uh, But go to the website. Uh, I would be uh, probably, I would miss on describing what it is. It's a very unique way uh, to show off your sports betting prowess, or if you want to get paid as a sports handicapper, you can do that. But that's what I'll leave it to, and we'll do more stuff with them down the line. But top five under-the-radar guys that are here at Big 12 Pro Day. And I'll start out with a guy that we talked to earlier. Uh, that you saw the interview. Number five, Philip Brooks from Kansas State. Um, With the new kickoff rules, uh, guys who can return kicks, uh, I mean, I I don't want to, like, overstate it here, but, like, if you were, okay, well, maybe let's look at this guy. We'll do this or that. You know, can he do these things? But now that you have a new kickoff rule that is going to make kickoffs, you know, fun and better again, I would say these guys got a 5% 
10% bump on interest from teams based on who their kick returners are right now and what they've been doing with kick returner because some teams, you know, kind of throw a guy back there because what's the point? It's just going to go out of the back of the end zone anyway. Uh, so, you know, having somebody back there like a Cavante Turpin to the Cowboys or, you know, a De- Devin Hester, Cordero Patterson just signed with the Steelers, and that's a hell of a grab for them the day, like the day the rule comes what out. What a career he's made. Yeah, I mean, so. Out of doing yeah. that. Yeah. So, but now you have these new rules. I think a guy like Phillip Brooks has a little bit more value. Yeah, I think it's it's great news for return guys uh, that there is going to be a bit more impact in that part of the game. Um, certainly could make the difference in a guy being on a team and not being on a team or being in the NFL versus being in the UFL or being in pro football and not being in pro football. So, yeah, I think that's great news for Phillip Brooks and uh, everybody else uh, that is out here looking to uh, – Make an impact in special teams. Have y'all actually watched the video of the XFL and how or yeah, yeah. how that all yep, worked? I sure yeah. do. I think it was pretty they, okay. They run like, all kind of trick plays off it too. Yeah, and, like I mean, it definitely uh, takes away some of the just down that field impact. That's just the car wreck aspect of it. You can still go up and pop a guy, but you just don't have all that the 30 yards of momentum behind you to just crush somebody. So uh, I, I watched a bunch of those videos and um, and how it would look in the long run. And I, I'm you know, you hear about it and you're like, ah, I don't know, it's, what are you doing? And then you watch it and you're like, okay, I can see where that opens things back up. And, and yeah, that's definitely good news for a guy like a Phillip Brooks. Yeah, absolutely. Number four, Josh Newton at TCU. Didn't get a chance to watch his workouts as much because they were on the on the show today, but here's a dude who's a bigger defensive back, a bigger cornerback, experienced, played a lot of games, uh, was a six-year guy. Not someone who's probably going to be high, high up, but third, fourth round, you can get a good cornerback who can tackle, who can make some plays for you. I'm very interested to see what happens with Josh Newton in the future. There's probably a little bit more buzz about him going into the season than I think with the TCU guys in general, maybe that bus kind of fell down because they didn't have a good season, but these are still a lot of guys like we had Jared Wiley on. They played the national championship just a year ago. So yeah. let's, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater because they, they kind of hit the collective sigh after the year. Yeah. You know, they went with names in the portal mm-hmm. brands um, to some extent. And then, you know, you had a situation like what was it? Brockermeyer had to end up medically retiring. Mm-hmm. And so it didn't, didn't really make uh, the impact that you had hoped he would. And um, you know, just, they were coming fresh off a national title. So you got, we're going to get some guys from Alabama like that are available. Um, but they still had plenty of talent left over. Like Jared said, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about like his part, his uh, mentioning of the leadership void and and him taking you know some of the blame for that i thought was really cool so i think tcu is going to be fine in the long run i think they're going to be okay i think sunny's going to get them back on track this year but uh, uh you, you mentioned uh josh newton, newton yeah and uh he's a really terrific player um and uh tcu is really putting them in the pros these days you know had the big class last year and i think they'll get uh more in this year and then we'll see what they're able to do actually results wise but um yeah I, I think he's a really good player uh to the running backs now and i'm staying with tcu number three amani bailey uh and he's someone who again i think kind of felt like he had two running backs in front of him a year ago and still played really well and then this year was a huge part of their offense you look at him he's built well like an nfl back he and ryan montgomery from cincinnati are the two that really got to keep your eye on and uh, ryan montgomery really going to fly under the radar but uh, i would say that imani bailey one that you know when you talk about the running backs in this year's class it's underwhelming um I think Trey Benson is the best one available, and then just right above uh, Jonathan Brooks. And it might be different if Jonathan Brooks wasn't coming off an ACL. But then you get in this kind of you know uh, group of Will Shipley and Braylon Allen and uh, Bucky Irving and guys like that. They're all good. And I think Imani Bailey can hang with all those guys. I really do. Um, and so he, he's going to be an interesting late-round pick and someone I think that can probably help a team. Yeah, he was he was dynamic, and uh, it's just a shame that running backs are valued the way that they are these mm-hmm. days. I mean, that's the the big downfall for for him as much as anything else. But yeah, he came in and uh, did his job well, and was a force uh, in the backfield for TCU. And sometimes they didn't have a lot of other mm-hmm. things clicking on offense. Uh, he was he was able to get something going for them. So yeah, you just you just don't know with running backs, man. Um, but I think he's definitely got a an NFL future ahead of him, and uh, he's a he's a really good player that I enjoyed watching up in Fort Worth. Yeah. By the way, uh, the Rock's involvement in the UFL, I've talked to a couple guys, like just asked them about, Mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, you see those guys here. They're much more excited about that opportunity than they would have been in the past. 
Like and they like this the thing they say because of the rock because of the rock okay. I think, because it's cool now yeah, yeah. so well I tell you he um he was not in the best of shape as far as I think appeal uh, up until here recently when he went back to WWE and he has returned to kind of a a mix of his old bad guy character um, and it's freshened up and he's involved himself now into you know, kind of the main storylines and it's totally done a 180 for his yeah. career whereas people were kind of getting tired of him yeah he's back to being like the rock the most electrifying man in entertainment and all that and so um i think he's hitting his point being he's hitting his peak again like right mm-hmm. as that league's about to start back up and i do think that will bring like a, a layer of like okay cool the rock's yeah. involved like sweet like yeah let's let's be a part of that and plus the fact that it's not like the one B or one C or one D version of the NFL minor league. It's, it's now it's the league. It's the minor league basically uh, behind the, or, you know, below the NFL. And so I think that'll make it more appealing rather than some guys are going to the USFL. Some guys are going to the XFL. Some, you know, uh, now it's all kind of more organized under under one roof. So, yeah, I can see where guys are more excited about that. Number two, and a guy that uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about today, but Arlen Bruce from Oklahoma State uh, didn't really – I mean, he got he was in Iowa. He got caught up in that kind of thing. He played in the CFL uh, this last year, and he, was, he wound up here. Okay. Uh, and he's someone who – uh, again, they they extended the invitation to. There's two guys, Arlen Bruce uh, from Oklahoma State, and then a guy named Quantez Stiggers who wasn't here today. He was not a Big 12 guy, but he has a really interesting story in that he had some family things happen. He never got to go play college football, and then got this CFL tryout and is killing it and is going to get drafted in this year's draft. I think Galco talked about him. We had him on. But Arlen Bruce is kind of in that same thing where he went in the CFL. He can now go through an NFL draft cycle and a really good player. Um, and someone, uh, I think, again, this is going to be totally under the radar, and he might be a you know an undrafted free agent, but someone who did well today, uh, and people kind of have their eyes on because he was a talented dude that, you know, obviously you know some circumstances went up and got him, but uh, here he is uh, trying to make a comeback. Yeah, I just uh, I pulled up Quantez Stiggers because I was curious. The last name Stiggers. Uh, I was thinking he's Marcus Stiggers. Yeah, the kid back that played the at Lake Highlands. A yeah, way hell back. of an option quarterback. Yeah, he's a terrific high school football player. They, he's he's a Colorado. Not, I don't think he is related though, because he's from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, apparently. But uh, just a quick glance at his bio, and he's he's overcome some stuff now. Um, depression caused him to drop out uh, of Lane College, despite being on scholarship. Uh, his father's death uh, mm-hmm. caused that depression, and that just kind of ended his football career at that point. So here he is. That's great. And I think it plays into your Mark's overall theme of, you know, some people probably have mentioned the WWE and eyes roll, but the fact that he's, like, got these avenues now mm-hmm. part of this pro day of, like, hey, if this doesn't work out, then maybe go get into pro wrestling. Or, hey, if this doesn't work out, maybe go get into NASCAR. Like, yeah. if this does, I think that's really cool. Like, yeah. I think that's some great outside-the-box thinking that's just uh, opportunity-driven for these guys. And so I, I had never thought about that, but I think that's an awesome um, – you know, another layer to have for this event is, is bringing in some outside opportunities to, to get these guys, you know, where they need to be in the future. But those two stories, I mean, sound very interesting. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to follow uh, both those guys and see what happens. West, wet blanket Oklahoma State fan. Sad as hell that we didn't get to see Bruce. Yeah. I think. I mean, look, I think he would have helped them out, especially early in the season when they couldn't find anything, like, outside wise mm-hmm. like he would have certainly helped them i mean they f- figured it out down the line obviously they played the big 12 title game but i think early in the season that was a big um you know like whammy for them not to have him and number one uh someone i will now forever call the gentleman from mississippi uh because i think he's going to be a senator one day oh. john rice Plumley, mm-hmm. uh who's one of our favorite interviews he was great uh but look he's not like as a quarterback you look at him he's a little dude he's not big at all uh but he is super athletic he's proud to be an athlete he'll do whatever you want and if you put him on a roster and have him you know have a package for him have some stuff in where he can run some stuff he's a special team he does these things and then you've got an emergency quarterback a guy who can i mean who has an absolute cannon uh you know of a baseball player arm uh, then absolutely uh i would i would take a flyer on more than a flyer on john rice plumley but i think he's someone uh, that you can certainly uh he can help your team win and he's got the right outlook on things and again great great you know locker room guy and everything you want to say about that but uh yeah he's absolutely uh, a, a dude i would i would put on my team and see what i could get from him because he's a superb athlete yeah, I mean, his just question is his health. Injury, yeah. He can't he can't ever seem to stay healthy, and I think with that limited amount of time, I think it probably halted some of his development as a passer. Mm-hmm. You know, just overall, but terrific athlete. Uh, obviously, has the baseball uh, side of his 
you know, athleticism as well. But I know you talked to him about not playing baseball because he's trying to get in the NFL. So I, I've been rooting for him based on just our interactions with him. He's been very cool both times we've uh, had an opportunity to visit with him. So, yeah, we're big fans, and he's a fun player to watch. Just wish we got to see a little bit more of him. Uh, but maybe we will someday in the uh, pros. Uh, certainly that's his, his hope and a lot of people's hopes for him and, and everybody else out here today. So uh, looking forward to seeing some dreams come true for a lot of these guys here in the next uh, month or so. You never know what Beanie Bailey did here today because he wasn't Beanie at Bishop. the uh, – Beanie Bishop did here today because he was not at – the NFL Combine might have gotten eight or nine more teams interested. I in didn't it. even think about that part of it, like because initially I was thinking, well, do you really need to have the whole big pro day? And then it dawned on me, kind of, in listening to him and a little bit earlier today, of like, yeah, well, if you're a school that doesn't have like anybody, like I imagine like the Baylor pro day this year. I'm just gonna use them because I know for for sure there's like three guys that maybe have a sniff. They're all three defensive linemen. Yeah, yeah, so like that's not even a guarantee. Like how many guys are gonna come out, right? And so. Um, and so, he's with us, man. He's with us. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. He's with us. <laughs> hey, it's, Daniel. It's my brother-in-law. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all good. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that bringing everybody under one roof is, uh, is actually a great idea for those guys who otherwise would maybe only have a handful of scouts show up, and now you're getting all 32 teams to, to have that opportunity is really smart, and, and that's the – that's the, the brilliance, I think, behind having this all-collective event. Can you tase him anyway? I just want to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Daniel, come get on camera for just two, just two, two seconds. Yeah. Just two seconds. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> come here. So this is Daniel uh, right in between the two of us. With, There's so, millions of people watching right now, Daniel. Don't be worried Daniel. about it, brother. This is uh, Jennifer's fiance. And Jennifer is my, And Jennifer is my sister. His sister and uh, my, one of our daughter. And Daniel is uh, – the one that tamed her. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's going to go over well. You got to do a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. That's no, fair. no, yeah. I mean, and, and uh, an unbelievable gentleman to her, and that's what matters. It, it, uh, good to see you. I didn't know you were coming. Yeah. <laughs> Sit down. Well, <laughs> yeah. So you know he's really good because he got into an, an event with a, without a credential. Yeah. <laughs> So that's that's good news. It's like MacGyver or something yeah. like that. Yeah, he's good. He's good. All right. Uh, so that's it. Thank yeah. you, Paul. We're the last ones here. We are. Uh, they're ready to shut us down. At least like at Big 12 Media Day, they would start cutting yeah. cords. Yeah. Yeah. Garrett Ross, thank you very much. Emery Winter, Jack McKenzie, who helped load everything up uh, when we left the, the city earlier this morning for Craig Smoke and Paul Catalina. Hey. This was a lot of fun. Sorry about a couple of the reverb. Uh, reverb uh, audio glitches, but I'm, something we're learning. I'm going to replay those tomorrow so okay. that people can okay, see good. them in their entirety. With Plumley, Plumley, uh, Brooks, okay. and uh, right. and Isaac Rex. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, that was a pretty good block in the last hour to make up for that. Your mark was great. Yeah. Um, hopefully, people got a lot of enjoyment out of all that. I think we asked pretty much everything we possibly could yeah. to him, and then Beanie was a, a great final guest as well. So yeah, this was cool. This was fun, and uh, hopefully, this is a regular thing. We will have uh, the Your Mark interview again tonight on 365 Sports tonight on the local. CW, but we tried to ask every possible question, and I thought he gave us transparency, which is something he said he wants, including the officiating and making sure that that might be more transparent when there are mistakes made, which I, I thought was great as they talk to the, he talks to the ADs about that. For everybody, our sponsor, uh, title sponsor. Uh, FundedSportsTrader.com. Check it out. If you're a, like, a uh, potential sports handicapper, if you've always thought you can, go to FundedSportsTrader.com, and you could perhaps become that. And all the rest of our great sponsors, day in and day out, I'm David Smoke. Good night from Frisco and the Ford Center, home of the Cowboys on 365 Sports.